everyone. Oh my God. Hello and welcome to the Roundabout Cast. Uh, Boo. So, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> um, so okay, just we we got to do an intro. We didn't rehearse this at all because I'm I'm with the three most annoying. Uh, we don't need to mates. rehearse. Yes. No, Austin's, Austin's not here, so we're okay. You're right. <laughs> um, so okay, who who are we? Everyone introduced themselves with their beautiful voices. Hello. My name's Bradley, by the way. You'll get to know me, don't worry. Joe, you go next. <laughs> I'm Joe. I'm not the host. I was chosen not to be. Uh, I, I'm Tyler. I'm not supposed to introduce myself. Yeah, because that's right. He's because, special guest the, Tyler. I'm the host. Hold on. He's, oh, shit. <laughs> he's, he's the special guest of this podcast for reasons we'll get into later. But um, I'm your host, Willer. Um, so who, what do we do, guys? How do we know each other? And why are we recording this? We're a bunch of nerds. We know each other because we're a bunch of nerds. nerds. We need to not talk over each other. That That's part of it. Uh, um, so, okay, basically, so we've worked together for like two years. Um, up until recently, Tyler was working with us, but he's still near, near and dear to our hearts. He's they a special... Well, he's a <laughs> he's a special guest for other reasons, unrelated. Um, uh, and yeah, we have a lot of bullshit, dumb talks, and we were wanting to record them for eternity because we have a good time discussing random shit. So, yeah, our uh, our main hobby is uh, just gushing to each other about stuff we're currently watching slash reading slash playing, um, and harassing the others into listening to us and or doing the same Big so we figured we'd do the that to everybody in the whole world oh yeah uh, that, i like that so you know i'm ex as excited with the audience to hear what the special reasons are that i'm here because uh those are even unknown to me same. You're right you know why you're the special guest but <laughs> i i don't I, i'm i am as excited as they are well to they'll, hear all, all 20. they'll have to wait until your segment which will come later um okay so i mean let's just let's not waste time here no one wants to even hear us to begin with our goal is to get 10 fans and then we'll retire from the podcasting scene forever i just want to make my first penny yes it'll really just be i'm in this for the money and nothing else it'll really just be drunk austin listening to it 10 times that, i hey, mean you know what that's enough that counts <laughs> he's got enough personalities up in his head so <laughs> we have a number of segments for this right. pilot episode we uh um, we kind of this is what we're going with for now and if it's terrible we're gonna find out afterwards um this is just a test but uh let's let's slide into our first segment which is uh bradley has been reading a manga called one piece you may uh, have heard of it you may have heard of it you may have not um let me first of all let me introduce all of our relationships with one piece so I've been reading it since I was like 12 or something. And once I met these guys, I kind of coerced them with my big dick aura to read One Piece. What an aura um, it is. So Tyler went first and he watched the anime and that is my biggest shame to this day. He wasn't very specific, I'll be honest. He just said you need to experience One Piece. <laughs> That's super nice. First of all, I was just talking about an arc and then you just started the next day. So I, that Jesus. wasn't even a... That wasn't even a recommendation. I, I I watched all of like I think they're I think they're on a uh, a thousand and ninety eight episodes or something right now. <laughs> Two hundred thousand episodes. They might have hit eleven 1, hundred, and I would just like to go ahead and say that I watched eight hundred and ninety episodes of One Piece in one summer. Yep. Like, I was very proud of myself for that. I had a lot of free time. And recently, um, Joe who I got into uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure before. He finished that, and then he started One Piece. And Joe, why don't you tell us about your world record pace, uh, world championship reading <laughs> speed of One Piece? Oh, Hi, my name's Joseph Lloyd. I, I read One Piece in about a span of 28 to 31 days. I, I, I honestly don't believe that, but... <laughs> like, that that's, just, that's kind of cumulatively, because there were definitely weeks where I just decided not to read it. But like, just, just, I would literally knock out like two volumes in a night at like a minimum. And even then, I would still go farther, probably. 
which is really not so, that yeah. bad. Um, it's it's not. He I wasn't started back doing... in January. Yeah, and he... I finished in the March, <laughs> and that which was with is... breaks in between. That's crazy speed, which That's... isn't really that much when you think about in... it. 38 chapters so in general um i think me and joe like it more than tyler but tyler i I think he still enjoys it he likes to theorize with us and discuss with us it's got a lot of uh it's got a lot of uh interesting concepts and and i will say like even for like minor character development it's like a top tier anime for that there's probably no other uh anime slash manga out there that i can think of uh, that has like you know you see a guy with green hair at anywhere, you know you're like oh that guy's gonna be in it somehow but I don't know how yet, and then he ends up being like a bad guy but slash good guy like super fan of our protagonist. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, uh, he does. And see, I can't even remember his name right now. That's but, fine. You know. No spoils. Yeah, yeah I, I'm there. Like it's it's great. It, it's got a lot of good stuff. It's got a lot of bad stuff. Um, if you're gonna watch the anime. Definitely, there's like some anime filler lists online that you just skip over right all over uh, all of that crap. It's, I, it's in my, in my opinion, you should read, but yeah, I, I do like Tyler's opinion. Um, the anime has colors. Yeah, the, well, the, okay, there's a colored version of the manga, so... Or you can just color in your manga like a coloring book and you exactly. get the same effect. Uh, That's what Bradley's been doing. So, that's what hold I've been on. doing with the Willard. Getting back to topic. No, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's the, so that was the nicest thing uh, Tyler's ever said about One Piece. So this podcast was worth it just because we got that recorded. Um, there's no escape. Well, um, pack it up, guys. Uh, so finally, Bradley, why don't you later, talk to us about you how you've begun One Piece very recently? Yeah, so I'm the latest to the One Piece party, a.k.a. Um, allegedly the greatest manga of all time to probably the greatest amount of people i'd imagine it's up there it's uh it's up there it's my um and i thought this would be really fun because like i i like really just started reading one piece from the very beginning and uh i had watched like a few episodes probably like six or seven years ago um and as i started from the first chapter of the manga i was like oh my gosh i actually don't remember any of this good um it's not like i watched very far anyway uh, so this will be fun for people who kind of want to experience One Piece for the first time again through someone else's point of view, I guess. Um, so if we want to get into what I actually have read so far, yes. um, in the past week, I have read up through chapter 29, which I believe is about halfway through the Usopp arc you would yeah. call it uh yeah. mr needle nose looking motherfucker. pinocchio yep yeah um and so i guess we could start with i gotta talk about this i'm not gonna be able to hit every single thing i want to talk about or else you know we'd be here for hours but um there well, are gonna be certain to parts of one piece means. i'm gonna want to talk about <laughs> um i think something that deserves special attention though uh is the first chapter of one piece and of all like introduction chapters and manga that I've read, uh, I I'm really impressed with this one. I think it did a really good job of showing, uh, like, okay, I know it's not representative of the whole series, but I think it did a good job of showing what kind of thing we're gonna get into here. Um, I guess certain things I really like is, uh, I feel like the the what would you call it reader? I was about to say player. Uh, I feel like the, I feel like the reader is rewarded for looking into the background and like picking up minute details already, because uh, one thing that jumped out to me, to me in the first chapter, is you see this like picture of a bandit captain on the back wall, and then um, later in the chapter he shows up and he starts making trouble and fighting with uh, Captain Red Haired Shanks. Um, God rest his soul. I think he's missing in the current day. But, um, no yeah, so the Spanish. And, uh, I feel like you're just kind of rewarded for, like, looking in the background and being like, oh, there's a, there's a wanted man on the wall back there. I wonder if he's going to be around later. Uh, and then here he is later. And I, cause, and the reason that impresses me, it, for anyone who's like, oh, whatever. The reason I like that is because I feel like in, 
a lot of other stories, they would have like had Luffy looking at the picture and someone would be like, oh, that's the bandit captain from the mountain. He's important. He's going to show up later. But this is just like a subtle deal. And uh, I, I really like the way it kind of played in uh, the background to what's going to happen. Yeah, um, One Piece does do a lot of environmental storytelling, so you're definitely right. There's uh, stuff to look at in the background, and one thing in particular, Oda's really good at drawing backgrounds. So I, I wasn't ever really big into Bleach, for example, but half of Bleach's backgrounds are deliberately like empty deserts because the author doesn't like doing backgrounds. So when I see Oda's really detailed backgrounds, I really appreciate that. And there's there's like recurring characters in that background, so you should look out for a, a man who's dressed like a panda. He's got like a panda hat. Um, I think it's more than a panda hat. I think it's more of a panda head. Mm. It's like the aliens in South Park that are just like randomly throughout. Yeah. Just oh, like yeah, just, I, I, I've never seen him in the anime. Really? I, I can probably find you, like, a guide of everywhere he's popped up. I bet you can, but I'm just, like, I'm going to go ahead and say I've, I only know, like, of one bear character in the anime. He's not really a character. He's more of, like, a gag. Yeah. Um, But me and Joe think he's, like, a... a a gold roger pirate member or something i don't know he's gonna he's gonna fucking show up like there's okay like not necessarily spoilers but there's a character so at the end of every chapter of the volumes oda the the writer or artist or whoever does a question and answers corner and one of them was uh, i forget what the specific question is but it's essentially talking about a carpenter in some village about repairing someone it's like uh who, f- who fixed the door in this chapter it was just like fixed the next chapter who framed roger rabbit exactly yeah it was yeah it was it was something like inconsistency and oda's like oh is this this dude he was from he's just a super good carpenter that was traveling by and then chapter like 909 this character shows up <laughs> jeez Wait, wait, who was that? He's the, <laughs> so he's the carpenter who's with Frankie right now? You remember that? Oh, yeah, what? Yeah, yeah. He, he was like a gag character from like volume six or something. Yeah. So Dude, okay, okay, so I like, this is unrelated to anime, but still like, dude, like with animation, can, can I throw some Rick and Morty trivia in there? Please, why don't you cringe us up? Why don't you raise our IQs? Okay, so, um... In uh, th- there's an episode that has to do with the uh, Summer gets a job working for the devil. Oh yes, yes like, that's a good one. Little gift shop, and he he gives all of his crap away for free, but then it curses people, and it's like he just kind of like s- stays back at his shop and laughs about it for some reason. He's just like, Haha, these people have bad luck. I don't, I don't know. He's the devil. So good trivia. Th- there's this woman <laughs> that comes in at one point. And she starts, like, just grabbing stuff randomly. And he's like, wait, wait. She's like, oh, what? It's all free, right? And she's like, yeah. He's like, yes. But and then like, let's just say you don't pay with money. And she's like, you pay with the curses, right? And he's like, yeah, what? And, and it's like this lady. And she's got a very distinct face with red hair. And I'm watching another episode where there is the hive mind that's taking over the entire planet. Uh-huh. And there's that same character but with like blue skin and a slight, slightly different shade of red hair but it's like the mm. distinction has like some kind of fat cheeks and like the same type of eyes because like rick and morty i think they have like 20 different types of eyes that they use for that, their the asterix eyes you know yeah, yeah, yeah their characters but like the shapes of the pe- like uh actual eyeballs and everything but i was just like huh like they, they reuse these background characters over and over i love shit like that yeah, and it's like whether it has some distinct purpose or not. And I'm like, oh, dude, that's that's a way to save a quick buck, you know? Now, do they use yeah. those characters 900 chapters later? Mm. No, nothing to that extent, but, you know, like... <laughs> no, uh, yeah, technically, no. We get Rick and Morty, like, once every two, three years, you know? Five years now? Yeah, once every five years, maybe it kind of keeps up. Maybe. But, I, uh... Go on, All brother. this is... Yeah, uh, as I was saying... Uh, all this is kind of related to another thing that uh, really interested me in One Piece in that uh, I've always kind of heard about these really long-running plot elements or having characters recur like this, and that really interested me because uh, it seems like Oda, from the beginning, always had a kind of a really good idea of where he wanted the story to go, 
Um, and when he introduces certain plot elements, he, uh, I, I think he has a very clear plan of where he wants that to go. And it, I just really like that kind of thing where he has this, he has this universe in his head and he knows which direction all the agents in that universe are moving. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I just think that's so cool. And so that's why I, I'm kind of having fun with, as I read it, picking out, um, characters or elements and trying my best to kind of, uh, examine them to figure out like, okay, how might this pop up later? Of course, there's no way I could possibly know at this point. Um, yeah, that, that goes far beyond what you can even imagine. Like there's shit that pops yeah. up later where it's like, what? This is coming back, but like in a good way. Um, mm. there, there's like a, yeah, there's like a very specific backstory with a later character that I think all of us are like, yeah, holy shit, that's a callback. I, I, I personally think like sometimes like, and, and I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum. I don't think they can see like I don't think when they're in arc two, they're like, uh, oh dude, I can use this guy in arc seven or mm -hmm. eight, you know, to like be this interesting character. I think they just kind of like look back and they're like. Huh, I, I'm at a block. I need some kind of new idea. What what can I use maybe? I, but I think I think one of Oda's like greatest skills and it it's he it's one thing that I feel like writers tend to like not think about is that he's when he ever he introduces the concept of something, it's always kind of uh, vague. Uh the first one the first one that stands out to me is um some people's names in one piece that that's kind of coming back nowadays. Uh, this mostly pertains to Luffy and his name, and which relates right. to a bunch of other people's names. Right, right. There's there's a character that we're told that this is his name, and it turns out that's actually in a, like a like a shortened version of their name, or yes. a kind of like a more. And so it it opens up a lot of ideas, and there are other points where it's he a character will do something, and that's Oda setting up the 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 idea of this sort of like theme system. Yeah, or, but or not system. having that system fully fleshed out yet. But saying like, I want to do this, but I need to figure out fully what I want it to be first. Like the which can, like early yeah. on, the seven warlord system is introduced really early into the series, and, and then tossed out very fast. What the fuck are you talking about? Anyways, <laughs> it's still there today. Um, back to what Tyler was saying, it's a mix of both. I, I think it's a mix of like Oda planning ahead because there's some things where like he really did. And then sometimes where he's making really smart callbacks. And even that's, a, I think, a skill of its own because another manga we read, they, he, he, JoJo's <laughs> kind of throws away a lot of shit, you know? Like, oh my god, I'm not about that right now. But yes. And let he, me just he, he, preface by saying JoJo's is like tied with One Piece as my favorite manga, but like, let, let's be honest here. I love it, but yeah. goddamn. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, though, that that's I feel like that comes out better more than often than not for JoJo's because he'll write himself into a corner yeah. and rather than try and like do this backward somersault to explain why this doesn't happen, he just drops entirely and changes gears. And you just have to kind of go with the flow of it. Uh, the, the, the most recent one being Notorious Chase, where it was very obvious that he did not know Notorious Chase. Notorious Big, where it was like he did not know where he wanted that stand to go until like halfway through that arc. Then it gets really good, but like yeah, his buildup is real bad sometimes. The, the most I, notorious of them all is fucking gold experience. That's a that's for an, another uh, time. It's a whole yeah, other okay. conversation. Back to One Piece. Uh, uh, hold on, Tyler had something he wanted to add in. Oh, no. oh did I? Oh, oh. So, I? Uh, uh, yeah, like the notorious Big slash notorious Big Chase, though. Like, Chase. like to just end that up, though. At least is when you want to be as inconsistent as that author is at least he does something better than what like a lot of comic book authors do you know God, yeah, where they just yeah. like oh time travel and that like fixes all the world's problems he's just like no this is going to be a world problem for the rest it's, of time at least it's written by the same idiot for the whole time you know like that yeah. that means a lot it's consistently inconsistent Okay, well, so real quick, <laughs> we scheduled a block yeah. for this for this segment, and we're gonna move on real quick. Bradley, why don't you just tell us how you felt about the the two arcs that you've read? Just give us like a quick rating summary breakdown, and then we're gonna move on. Yeah, and that would be that's, buggy. That's, that's yeah, that's Romance Dawn, which is basically up Zoro's arc. Morgan, and, Morgan and Alvita. Morgan Alvita, uh, right. Buggy the Clown. 
and I think now he's on Syrup Island. Kuro what? arc. Yeah, uh, arc. you can give us yeah, some little, preliminary thoughts. Yeah. So I guess the the first main arc, Captain Morgan. Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, I don't think it was particularly. I don't think it's particularly different than uh, something you'd see kind of in the beginning of any other yeah. uh, standard shonen, Agreed. but that's fine because I can't really expect it to be like, oh my god, this is a, like this is the best manga of all time off the bat. But uh, I mean, that being said, it was enjoyable. Uh, I feel like you gave it like a Oda's... three, right? Three out of five. Yeah, it, I think, that's, uh, I think which, that's a really which, fair score. Which is good. Yeah, that's a good score if you ask me. And uh, I, I think what makes it so enjoyable so far is. Uh, Oda's art because it just moves Jesus very cleanly. Christ. Um, it reads very naturally, and there's one moment where I forgot who Luffy was punching. He's but punching he's like, fucking Richie or uh, Moji. Yeah, he, one of the, God. Well, oh. or no, he punched well. the soul out of this man, and it's like you could almost hear his if, head hit the pavement just because of how it looks. If I put page. any effort into this podcast, which I won't, um, I'll, I'll put a picture of that in the YouTube video, but it's it's not gonna happen. So whatever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> can we use the Robin, the Robin Wa picture? We can't. That's a big spoiler. That's an emotional picture. It is an emotional picture. <laughs> oh, and, our uh, biggest boner yeah. killer. <laughs> uh, that's I like guess the best as for image ever. Um, the Captain Buggy arc, which came next, uh, we had a, kind of a little ramp up and in intensity here. Uh, Buggy was a really fun personality. He wasn't just like, ha, 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 I'm evil. Well, I guess he is kind of like that. But, <laughs> but you know, like he in a fun really, way, like, in a way he, that he, works. Yeah. He, he had more personality than just evil pirate captain who's going to fuck everybody up. He's no more um, Yeah, good theme. Um, but I think in the story, it's also really fun because really early on, we're establishing Luffy on this grand 900 to 1,000 chapter adventure is going to be encountering other people who have devil fruit powers like he does. Um, and it kind of got me excited to see what other powers we're going to run into in the future. Yep. Uh, For sure. I, I want to I ask one question. Okay. What, what, what's your opinion right now of the Navy government? Like, as like a... Mm, good question. Like, like, looking at it right now. Because I have... I had a, I had a, I, uh, I had an opinion on the Navy when I first started, and my opinion on it now is 100% <laughs> different. Like, yeah. it's it's crazy. But yeah. That's... So, I guess, uh, what what's the name of Luffy's friend who... Helmeppo. Oh, no, sorry, Kobe. Him? Jesus. Kobe. Yeah. <laughs> Kobe so, Yashi. <laughs> the, the one, I guess, um, segment of the Navy we've seen right now uh, was run by very power hungry corrupt individuals or individual rather um and you know i think you, you're it's supposed to be seen as like holy crap these are you know these are very not <laughs> nice guys um which i i don't think that's representative of the entire navy because someone like kobe um he's just a he's just like a real boy scout yeah just like a real straight shooter kind of kid um, and I, I, if I thought every chapter of One Piece's Navy out there um, was like this one particular group, he would never have a desire to join them. I think it was just this particular one they ran across was led by a total asshole. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, at that moment in the story, we kind of needed them to be bad guys um, so that Luffy and Kobe would have someone to fight together. Um, we needed a way to introduce... Zoro to the story mm -hmm. um and having an evil navy accomplished both of those things so I, I i think one piece's navy is a fundamentally good force i just i just think that one guy was being a dick when i first like encountered them they felt very i don't want to say bumbling idiots but they felt very like not collected and not very strong in this world hmm. because you no see pirate. luffy yeah, because you have you see Luffy run around, you see like pirates are really well known, like and there's not they don't have really a presence on like the previous island that you see, um, and I, I felt like they were a very minor power at the beginning of this series. Yeah. And we then, are in the golden age of pirates, so it could very well be the case that the navy is fighting against pirates and. Bradley, that's I ha more than they can handle. <laughs> I have a question for you. Have they introduced the concept? 
They haven't, have they? The Grand Line? They haven't introduced no, but that. Uh, we've, we've seen it. They've talked about it, and they said it's basically... It's like a sea route around the world, right? Yes. We'll okay. get into that a bit more later, but the Grand Line is where shit gets actually real. So you're in one of the four oceans right now where it actually makes sense for the Navy to be weaker because there's weaker threats that are kind mm -hmm. of around there. Um, They're in the kiddie pool. We're yeah. in the kiddie pool right now. Um, Joe, I think I have a fundamentally... I, I had a different opinion than you at the start. I, I think we might actually be in the same spot how we see the Navy now. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. Like... It's, it's, it's pretty complex, their role in the world, but we'll get to that later. Um, mm -hmm. what's... <laughs> Several months later. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Two hours later. Yeah, a little, a little bit more. All right, let's mm -hmm. let's wrap up this segment. Um, One so... Piece is a good game. I mean, manga, fuck. <laughs> fuck. <laughs> you ruined it all. We had such a good... Okay, so actually moving on. Our next segment, I wrote news and shit. I kind of wanted Tyler just to talk about the burning no, of the... We have... Willer... We're going to talk about the Sekiro. Uh, f that comes after this one. No, it says... Oh, oh shit, you're right. <laughs> I have it right in front of me. Power of editing. Tyler, do you want to say anything about the Burning Cathedral real quick? I, d I just wanted to hear your thoughts on it. Cause I really can we get, can we get okay. a quote? T Tyler's really interested in architecture, so I actually wanted to hear this uh, from him. I actually so... don't know the full story, by the way, so you can educate me. Um, so, like, that's my background is actual architecture. We all work together in a completely unrelated industry, though. But, uh, I, I, I have a bachelor's in architecture, uh, that my minor is art and architectural history. So, that, like, minor, it's, like, studying, like, Baroque, Rococo, uh, ancient architecture from, like, uh, oh, like, it's not Pange Pangea, but, like, the fertile yeah. Crescent, the, yeah, but like from like the fertile crescent all the way up through like, uh, like to Egyptian slash Roman Greek, like all of that. So, um, let's talk about Notre Dame happening today. That's on fire. That is, I think, twelfth century, thirteenth century, uh, Damn. cathedral, um, like built in Paris. And I think there's, like, uh, there is another cathedral that shares a similar name but it's not that one i it, it's like that's it's like literary name uh that's used in classrooms so uh we're talking about notre dame fire in paris holy crap that is it is crazy and it's weird to think about that we're living in history right now hmm. it it's it's just uh like it okay first of all it took 200 years to build this cathedral jesus. jesus yeah it was started in the 12th century it was finished building in the 14th century um one of its most notable features being the rose window uh on the western face you know and uh of the church but just uh, overall the scale of architecture in paris and everything it was just groundbreaking and it's been standing till this day you know and it's like, I, I've been reading stories and I've been hearing from people like, oh, yeah, like, my family members are crying about it. And I'm like, your family has never been out of Texas. Like, why are they crying, you know? That doesn't make any sense. They're like, oh, they preserve history. And I'm just like, oh, whatever. But, like, oh, seeing, like... No, come on. That's fair of them. It's... It, yeah, it's fair. But yeah. anyway, it, it's it's tragic. It really is. It's honestly, it, it's more important to Paris than the Eiffel Tower. If the Eiffel Tower collapsed at this like tomorrow, it would pale in comparison to the damage that's been done to the cathedral. It, I it, concur. It really seems like one of those things where it's like, oh, this is gonna be here forever. It's like the pyramids or the Statue of Liberty or Big Ben or something. It's like one of those things that we thought until like a world war blow blows us all up. It's one of those things that's gonna be there forever. But yeah, it, it's truly stood the test of time and. It, it's irreplaceable history. It, it, it's not just because cathedrals and churches, uh, like back in the day, uh, you know, they, they ruled everything. Like the world revolved around the churches. So that's where yeah. all the knowledge was stored as well. It wasn't stored in universities and things like that. It was stored in the churches, the cathedrals, all these important documents, hist uh, historical 
events and uh, historical scrolls and everything. They're stored in the cathedrals, in their underground tombs and chambers uh, and vaults of the sort. So, like, what the, the articles I'm reading earlier, they don't know if the vault's been affected or not. Uh, they were still fighting it, I think, at, like, 8.30 p.m., uh, whatever time zone Paris is in. I think that was, like, 2 p. It's a, That's, like, noon our time or something. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, there's no way to really describe it. It's besides being the worst thing ever. And the sources say, like, here's the, the, like the worst part of it is the sources, uh, in the news outlets, they're saying that the fire started from technical failure of some machinery that was being used to repair the spy, uh, the spire in the cathedral like they were doing repairs on it hmm, that's really and, and that's what they believe started the fire at least it wasn't some arsonist asshole as far as we know you know you yeah some dude sitting at home right now who set up that wire and he's like fuck <laughs> I, dude and on, like here's the worst part is it, even so far nobody knows the real cause but I, the, the, at least as, as the time of this recording the real cause has not been found yet if they go back and realize that this was an attack, that is, or like this was planned, but unorganized by anyone. Oh, yeah. No matter who it is. That's an act of terrorism, uh, basically, right? They're banned uh, from Earth. Th this is, okay, and, and this is a really tragic comparison, and, and I'm not talking about what oh, was great yeah, about this here one. We is go. That, <laughs> no Controversial. Wee woo. No lives were lost in this, and that was fantastic. Nobody was hurt. Nobody yeah. was injured. The firefighters are, like, working diligently to put the fire out. But in the same instance that we had 9-11 happen in America, which was tragic amount of lives lost, but the tragedy of losing monuments in New York City mm. that towered above the sky, like, skyline. Archaeologically speaking, um, yeah, this, you, this is, you think it's yeah. comparable? It is comparable, yes, archaeological and historical. Now, now that is assuming that um, if it turns out someone did do it, you know, yeah. Yeah, I really because, hope it was an accident. Yeah, if it was an accident, that's the worst thing because someone's just like you have one guy that's just gonna feel, be guilt ridden, and and like, dude, ugh, accidents happen, but I, like that guy still may go to prison for the rest of his life. We gotta blow somebody up for this. <laughs> and that's what <laughs> like hopefully no but okay honestly i've traveled through uh, europe a little bit churches I i'd like to point out that the churches and cathedrals are just fire hazards waiting to happen you know oh, why yeah. and every single apps and like nave they have just corners inside every single cathedral they just have candles candles out the dick they have yeah they have candles everywhere and not only that they let the people light the candles they got like oh. the two-year-olds in there like they let fucking those, like... jimmy jimmy light some candles <laughs> Ooh, they got the guy at the front table. with a bag holding like punks you oh. know just like giving them to kids like hey go light a Pull candle up. say a prayer drop in a quarter you know and light it on fire yeah and like that was my first thought i was like dude it's the pair of candles man they're gonna start banning those across like churches all across uh europe like they're they, they have stone facades, but they have wood infrastructures. Like, people are talking about, like, the fire's burning a really weird color. I'm like, dude, that's wood from, like, 10 centuries ago. Like, 10 centuries ago. Of course it's going to be a weird color, man. Um, See, this is why he's special guest Tyler, because he's cultured and we're not. <laughs> I, I just no, have random this, architecture. This isn't why. <laughs> I'll tell you why it is later. Um, Tyler, I, I'm still waiting for the special guest. One more question before we uh, move on to the next segment. Um, so... How bad is the damage so far? Like, is it is it like it's fucked? Like, it's ruined? Like, what are we looking at? Um. Uh, so I know that one of the the towers, or I think, it's spires collapse. I I don't know what type of light here. I'll pull up the live updates right now, you know, and see what's uh what's been going on because I think uh the the CNN's doing updates and everything and everybody's posting art about it it's all anyone's been talking about all day um i know that the nave um which is kind of like where the alt i think it's the nave or the at uh, the apps uh which is at the 
opposite end of the Steve Patrol. So if the Rose Window is at the west end, this is at the eastern end. It, that has to do with holy direction of something. Uh, I, I could be getting those mixed up. Very holy easily. feng shui. I, I, yeah. So uh, that collapsed in. I know that the roof of that collapsed in. I know one of the spires collapsed. Uh, they're saying that the fire's under control as of like an hour ago. Um, and I'm uh, there. What I'm reading now is that a lot of artifacts were saved, such as like, here's a big one that was stored at Notre Dame, and this is for what may a lot of y'all know, the Crown of Thorns, mm. which was supposed to be placed upon Jesus, was stored there. And it, it was it was saved. Oh yeah, yeah. They they, they like, I, hey. I believe once the fire was under a structural or near structural control, which probably would have been about three to four hours ago. Um. People started running in to probably save uh, artifacts and everything, which, yeah, the, the spire collapsed earlier in today, and we were able to get a fire from that. Or there was a video of that posted on Twitter um, from across the river. But, yeah, it's a... Uh, it, it's... It's a bad look. It's ridiculous, man. Like, I, the... I, the, the, the uh, I do appreciate people... <laughs> People running in to save artifacts, like, that's really dumb and dangerous, but at the same time, like, man, that that's art. Like, I, I do appreciate that. Mm -hmm. that's, I, that's 900 years of art. It's not just, like, yeah. you know, it's, 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 like, way back, like, even, like, before, like... It's historical. Actual, yeah. Well, to... <laughs> to move on to a related topic, let's talk about samurais and the burning of, of Asahina Castle. <laughs> All right. A long time ago okay. in a distant I, I, land. I would like to preface with the fact that uh, I, I'm very happy to be on this podcast. What I'm not very happy about is this next, seg next segment. Really? You can I, I, I'm very excited about Sekiro. We but he, he's he's spoiled by it. He, but he I don't it want spoilers. Ooh. And I have wasted, at this point, I deserve it because of what I've been doing the past week. Well, I'll tell you what. We'll, we'll try to walk around spoilers. Um, and, and when it comes to a Souls game, I think visual spoilers is a, is a bigger deal, you know? So I think we'll be fine. I, I've already been spoiled on the monkey, so you can give I, I think that's, like, the, the best fuck, one. Fuck, the monkey's a good one. <laughs> oh, you can give no, the general well, for the He game. hasn't been spoiled on the actual thing about the monkey, though. Yeah, okay. no, I have. You I want... have. I know the real. I know the deal about the monkey. Shit, man, it's a good deal. What's, what's the deal about the monkey? Tell me Wait, the deal well, about the monkey. Well, hold on, Bradley. Tell me the fucking deal like... about the monkey. <laughs> Spoiler well, alert. <laughs> okay, yes. so th we're, to start Sekiro, let's talk about the monkey first. Okay, <laughs> that's where <laughs> you me, start. Tell me about the monkey. This is spoilers, by the way, just in general, but not the style. I'll, I'll try to spoiler monkey. cast this or spoiler he, tag this, but whatever. Spoiler you start cast. Start fighting him, all right? And it's big. Okay, first of all, let's talk about the smaller monkeys that we'll. No one cares about the smaller around. monkeys. I care, just about human I care about the smaller, about the smaller monkeys. monkeys. Those things are so cool Fuck for you, some of them. Like, look at these monkeys. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the big monkey, the king of monkeys, uh, that guy, you chop off his head. Uh, you have this nice epic fight with him, then you chop off his head. And then he picks up his head, and he's like, all right, let's do it, round two, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you're like, all right, I'm going to kill him again now that his head's off. And then he's like, all right, I got this, though. We got we got just a flesh wound going, you know? No, you, you like, do kill him. Arm. Yeah, yeah, you eventually do. But, you know, I, I get the gist with the uh, immortal monkey. Okay, so let's back it up just a couple of steps. So... <laughs> So me, well, whole game back. Spoiler, spoiler session done for a little bit. Me, Do you even know about the monkey, bro? <laughs> me and That's Joe what started it. have been playing a little game called Sekiro. Um, Shadows die twice. It's, it's the, the official title. It's yes, it is the new From Soft game. Um, I'm quite a fan of From Soft work. Uh, Joe's kind of a fan. Uh, he's probably I've, not. I've a... played Dark Souls and I played Bloodborne, but I've. I haven't been either of them. I know I know we're close on being them. I both enjoy I enjoy both of them. It's just they're long, and I can get frustrated, and I just kind of put things down and pick them up as I go. And it gets really hard to go back to an old game that a studio has worked on after you've played a newer version of that game because there's a bunch of mechanics that are missing that you really appreciate. <laughs> so the about that. Uh, yeah. Maybe we can rope Bradley into this because he's also been playing Dark Souls for the ninth time uh, pretty recently, right, Bradley? Yeah, and I watched you 
play uh that's right the first several hours of Sekiro uh first drunk week. and or hungover yes so i have some memory of it um okay so Sekiro um i'm <coughs> gonna lead this off by saying i think joe likes this game more than i do oh i definitely like this game much more than you like 100 percent. 100 percent. um not to say that i dislike Sekiro but uh, so Sekiro is a game where you only have one weapon. It's your katana. Um, the gameplay revolves around getting your enemy's posture down. So you attack them, and they block your attacks, or they take damage. And as you attack them and raise their damage, you're also raising a bar called the posture bar. And once that's maxed out, you can kill one of their lives. Most bosses have two lives. Um, some have more. And less. Uh, so with that in mind... I, every boss kind of feels the same after a while. You only have one weapon. You have these cool tools that you can use just a little bit. Like, for the final boss right now, which I, I've beaten the final boss. Joe hasn't. Joe's run out of tools. So, like, that's what happens in a lot of fights where you just run out of your the one thing that makes combat a little bit different here and there. You just run out and then you're like, okay, I'm just going to go slash stuff. Um, very different from how other FromSoft games is. And what... What adds to this is that I've also recently been playing Bloodborne. I decided to go back to it. Um, this is my second playthrough now. Uh, Bloodborne is one of the, my favorite games ever. So it's it's really hammering some of the problems I have with Sekiro. But but Joe, you, you talk a little bit. So so here's the counterpoint. Um, I'm a person that likes to uh, really pick one thing, like like one weapon or one tree or once right. or one class, and get really good at it. Like, I just, I like the, I, I, I see something like, I like the way or the idea behind this. I want to get good at it. I want to figure it out. And the thing with Sekiro is that it really, it doubles down on that where you are, it's like you have your katana and that's your bread and butter. And you have these other gadgets and the gadgets do give you some sort of like customization of what you can and can't do. A little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Like, it, it lets you approach situations differently. Mm -hmm. um, but they don't really overall interact. They don't provide a really big change in the, the combat unless you're, like, really good with them, and I'm not. Um, <laughs> I, I figured out how to be good with them, but yeah. Yeah, it's it's it, I, I forget them, like, 90% of the time because I'm really focused on wanting to get good on, like, pairing. using the katana and pairing and all that. And I, am, and I like that system a lot. Because I like the the game focuses more on you looking at your enemy and seeing what your enemy does and perfecting defeating an enemy rather than you perfecting how your character plays. So because mm, okay. I, I think so. I gotta because, I, because there's <laughs> but there's not because there's not so much you can do. You have to really focus more on like what everyone else is doing around you. So I you know, I feel that the other games, the other FromSoft games, had had it both ways. Where you have to learn your enemy's move set, but you also have to learn your weapon. But go on, go on. But I feel like, but that gets old once you get like an eighth into the game. So like, oh. if they're basically just skipping that step and just saying, "Here's what you have. Just that's all you need to worry about," and you just have to investigate everything else if you want to change. And I get people like that because I do too. Because I, Will and I play Monster Hunter until the end of time, basically. Yes, but it's 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 just like. I feel everything's much more tighter combat wise. I feel less like jank and kind of like spinning out of control, dodging people when I'm playing this game. And this game is is less about moving around. It's it's kind of weird because you're supposed to be a ninja, and your general thoughts about ninja are them being stealthy and maneuverable and like really kind of like. And that is true for mobility. Right, your 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 evade button sends you across the fucking map sometimes. It's crazy. And you got uh, your grapple hook. Yeah, and your grapple hook. But, like, at the same time, like, a lot of the game is about standing your ground and really focusing yes. on the deflex and what your opponent is doing. It takes a while for you to learn that lesson, but eventually you do. It, it does, especially, like, I like, think I had... butterfly, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think I had a better time of it than Willard did, because Willard's played a Bloodborne a lot and Dark Souls enough yeah. times, I think. I, I played um, it three a lot. Yeah. Right, and, and with those games, I kind of... I played them, and I, I got... I think I want to say I put like 15 or so hours into both of them easily, but like I, I just, I never played them enough for their tactics being great into me. So when I went to Sekiro, it was kind of, it wasn't that big of a, oh, I just need to, I need to focus more on like looking at the thing in front of me and deflecting it. Because I remember distinctly there's a point, there's a boss, it, I guess it's a mini boss. Um, the, the spear, the spear motherfucker. 
No, it's it's the guy right before. So you, you go to Ashton Castle. It's the boss right before you fight the final boss. Not the final boss, but the boss on top of that castle. You know who I'm talking about? It's a samurai. It's like a samurai, and he has one sword. And so when he he and he's he surrounded by him. gunners, yeah. No, it's that's not him. Um, he's basically he's in this like room by himself. Oh fuck that guy! Yeah, he he's a samurai samurai. Like yeah. Yeah, and you you go in and like he the only way he attacks is that he keeps his uh sword into his sheath and then he does really two really quick strikes and they're Very like fast. almost instantaneous and like if you try to dodge you're going to get killed because the oh, enemies in this game have a lot more more tracking in see, them see i beat him by just running left he can't he he can't physically hit you if you run see, left <laughs> but here's the thing willer if you just deflect both of those hits you immediately kill him it's true you you get like 50% like, posture damage w with one good deflect Right, but so it's, it's so fast. But the, but the boiler, don't be a baby. <laughs> I beat the game. Um, I know, and I'm trying. But like the the thing is, is I, I think like the one thing about the final boss is that it it takes about everything else that you've done, but for some reason it feels more Souls boss like where you need to be. I don't. Know, I'm finding man. myself running around everywhere in this fight. Like I literally can't sit still and fight this dude because his attacks are just so. Maybe that's. I don't want to say. Random. Maybe but that's they're just they're just kind of everywhere to I, me. I think that's why you you're kind of struggling with them. I I started doing that and then eventually started doing my stand my ground thing. Um, that being said, you do have to stay a certain distance from him. But um, yeah. So basically, Joe seems to like the fact that you have one really defined combat style and you get to learn that. I think. Well, yeah. I think you should play Destiny. <laughs> Ew, get, this is not the time for this. <laughs> Shameless destiny plug. Yeah, Tyler's our resident Schluter boy. Mm -hmm. he, he plays big Schluters. The the reason why I I prefer it because when you have Bloodborne and Dark Souls and you have so many different move sets, it it becomes a little bit more difficult to create these enemies that can account for all of these different move sets, but also not oh, I don't know, fully man. punish something. Like like you can get come to you can get to a an enemy that really punishes you for the moves that, that you're doing or, or there's like that you're doing. there's like one weapon in Bloodborne that's a cheese weapon and it's the uh, Ludwig sword where it's just kind of objectively the, the best noob easy weapon but even then like I feel like every boss and, and here's here's the big thing um in environments and in bosses I think. The Souls and Bloodborne series just shits on Sekiro, man. I, I think, I think have... the environment in Bloodborne is so much better. So, but I so... had so much more fun fighting the bosses in Sekiro than Bloodborne, <sighs> 100%. But the Sekiro bosses, first of all, half of them are just dudes with weapons. And, and they are tough, but there's no visual variety. You fight the same samurai with a spear, like, at least two or three times. You fight the samurai with a sword, like, three times. You fight the ninja, like, three times. And they just have different names, and I really don't like that. Meanwhile, every blood and every, every boss in Bloodborne, um, they have really different move sets, and they're really weird. I just fought um, Vicar Amelia, who's the Rudolph, the rain red nosed reindeer ass. Like she's in the cathedral, right. or whatever it she is. She has like a Healy move, and she focuses on these big ground pounds, and she's got like a grab and like claw swipes, and and like. Claw swipes, for example, that's something a lot of bosses have. But her ground pound, or her and her heel, and her visual design and her music, like they're all so unique. And Sekiro doesn't have any of that uh, for for the most part. Like the monkey is the boss that stands out. The final boss kind of stands out. Genichiro stands out, and then Gyobu stands out because Gyobu is my boy, and I know you like him too. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the other the other guy you fight on top of the castle stands out too oh fuck yeah but, yeah you're right but the, i i think named... so i think i think the thing is i named is like they really want to... there i'm just saying but but at the same time like you're they gave up these kind of rig, really big bosses to focus on these more smaller consistent mini bosses yeah. where you where they really want to teach you these mechanics and you get really good at these mechanics and then so when you get to these bigger bosses that have these huge variable move sets you, you at least have your fundamentals down because i think the problem is the problem that you face in this game when you're designing is like how do we teach this player that how you do the mccary counter how do you do the jumping counter and how do you do the deflects and how do you time yourself and like 
and having these kind of like more consistent bosses like they're almost like fundamental practice like if you were like doing basketball or baseball or mm -hmm. whatever they're yeah, just practice yeah. bosses for you to do um and i get that and like i think and i agree with you that like bloodborne wise even like, Dark Souls i think is... bloodborne shits on everything like environment and theming wise bloodborne like took its theme and killed it and like i just but it's, it's hard for me to like just you know compare Sekiro to Bloodborne because it's not Bloodborne. Right, I, I wanted to get there. I, I also don't want to say that Sekiro is bad because it's not Bloodborne. First of all, Sekiro is not bad. Um, I'd probably... It, I'd yeah. still give it like a 3.5 or like a 4, which is a good score. I, I It's a good. It's a great game. Um, I, I would still put it above Bloodborne for me, but that's because I just enjoy the combat so much more. I think environment-wise of like wanting to see again i think it definitely goes to bloodborne because bloodborne just has so much more mystery to it and just craziness to it and that enemies. you really just you fight and... samurai and monk and and the guy who goes woo and that guy is... <laughs> and is that, that guy is great yoshimitsu uh almost <laughs> you there might as well be yoshimitsu in this game he, he's yeah. cool and then so i was talking to bradley i was like oh man i can't wait till the weird shit gets in the game and it doesn't really get there until like the I... very end and that's so true. That's not even a that's not even a Souls game comparison. That's a comparison to Neo, because Neo went super hard on its like Japanese yokai shit, and but, I, I kind of like that better. But the other thing about Sekiro, I think, is like its story isn't meant to be really into the weird setting. Like it's not Bloodborne when you're investigating like what's happening to this city or town. <sighs> you fight some dragon trees, man. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but but the the point of that is that it's a very much more grounded story of like a heritage of a family. Like there there's a an inheritor to a, th a throne, I guess, quote unquote, to this castle, and he's like we're being taken over i didn't do every he's struck he has to do everything he can to like put the to bring his like kingdom I back need together this little boy he says yes and and like so these elements are in there but the the main story is very much still human about trying to like maintain your individuality when it comes to like people trying to like yeah. succeed you or like fold you into the group so you kind of have to like balance that out i'll say and i don't uh, just real quick while we're on the topic of story, I, I do actually really like Sekiro's story, and for once I appreciate it being more direct than um, the other Souls game story. Do you think <laughs> any Souls story, whatever? Not, do you not like Dark Souls, the uh, the environmental storyteller? Uh, the environmental storytelling still. is good, and I, there's a little bit of that. I think in Dark Souls it does it better. Um but what I don't like about Dark Souls very much is that it's read the item description of the game. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sekiro has that long. a little bit. Yeah, also that. What, um, what's funny is that in Sekiro, I was more invested in, like, reading more about Sekiro's world. Yeah. But they use so much little compared to, like, Bloodborne and Dark it's Souls. It's true. It, because the story is more direct, I think I wanted to read more. I wanted to know yeah. what's the deal with Genichiro and the Tomoe of Lightning or whatever the fuck. Um, that, like... I'll give there it was back. Even like, there, there's a thing that happens at the very end of the game for the final boss. I didn't like and, that thing, but we talked about it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and I was just like, well, there's literally an item like right next to like another person that you just have to grab, but you don't yeah. see it when I, you I like first walk into that room. Unfortunately, and it kind of foreshadows what's gonna happen, but but at the same time, that's in every from soft game where you're just like, I don't know what the fuck is happening, man. <laughs> what is going on? But I feel like. It's. I feel like though, with the limited moveset that it had, like in terms of what you can do, there were still a lot of interesting bosses that felt like you were never forgetting a piece of your move set. I think the only one that kind of occurs where it's a non something you'd never do is in the monkey fight where you basically never reflect deflect because it's Fuck that just. Fight. It's fight. a cool fight. I love but... that fight, I, uh... which I think is hilarious. I think you and I have very opposite fights and like <laughs> opinions on all these things. Yeah. It barely happens. Here's the thing. I shit on the fights where it's just attack, attack, deflect, deflect, but those are also the best fights. So it's kind of like – it's kind of a shitty situation. Um, I, it's just – in my opinion, this is the best game where it feels like you're clashing swords with something. Like you're, you, it feels like an actual sword fighting so, game. Real quick, since we want to move on pretty quick from, from here. We're on segment three and it's been like an hour. <laughs> um, What's your point? 
Uh, so I, I want to talk about the things I really do like about it. We were just saying the deflection, like fighting, I said when I first played the game, it's like fighting feels like music where it's like it has a rhythm to it and it's really nice. So I feel like they really nailed the mechanics. I really, really like the three unblockables and then they add lightning at the end or not at the end, but they add it throughout the game. Um, those, those unblockables and the mechanics around them are really good. I just think the the moves that you get, the way, the bosses you fight, they're not as good as other games. Um, and to that note, like Bradley has been playing Dark Souls, right? And then he started a run where he was like a certain type of character. And mid midway through, he decided to become a berserk fanboy, and now he's cosplaying guts. Like Bradley, can you talk about that a little bit? If you're still alive, he's probably dead. yeah. So it's like I was concurrently doing two different Dark Souls runs that play wildly differently because on one of them I was like oh well Dark Souls is just the Berserk game and it has Guts's Golden Age outfit in it so I'll just play as Guts um, and so I got to play the entire game uh, being an ultra great sword wielding strength boy um, which is very different than how most people would normally play the game because if you're two handing a great sword, that means no parrying and no blocking. All, blocking is and big in Dark Souls. Basically, basically worthless blocking, um, which means your only real option is rolling. And uh, it's going to be. It, it made a lot of the bosses very different than the first time I played the game. I think traditionally, Gwen is seen as actually one of the easier bosses because you just parry him and you win, but I couldn't parry. And holy shit, he was the hardest <laughs> boss on the game for me. He does not... There's zero break in his attacks. And and I think this is my closing point. Um, Sekiro is not Bloodborne, and it's not Dark Souls. But the fact it's so limited, I have no desire to play it again. And it's doing its own thing, but I kind of like the old thing better. And, and that's... I, it's still a great game, and that's just kind of where I can leave that. Not as replayable as um, I think the other so. Soulsborne games. Yeah. Closing thoughts from Joe. I really like Sekiro. I like it better than Bloodborne currently, gameplay-wise. <laughs> but, but the thing about Bloodborne is I'll probably go and play Bloodborne again because I just like being in Bloodborne's world. And But I'll play Sekiro again after I've kind of forgotten everything. Mm, yeah. Um, and, and kind of really want to get back into it and probably be faster in, like, completing it, if that makes sense. Like, Bloodborne, yeah. I'll, I'll do in paces, but Sekiro is just, like... It's so I feel so much more fluid and so much quicker in it. I just want to keep going. You can and really so, optimize yourself in that game, so I could see why you want to come back and like kind of speed run it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I feel like for New Game Plus, it's always what always interests me in New Game Plus roads is yes, they they increase like the difficulty of some things, but it's always fun to go back to like the level one starting zone. But now you have everything unlocked. So what was so what's it now like to fight these like low level bosses with the skill that you have? already known and the the tools that you've already unlocked and what's it like to like how does that change my situation and like how much more can i dominate and how much and it makes you think about how much you rely on like this one tool or this one tool because you you, yeah. you go through this area and you think like i did i did this area before i even had this tool but now i'm constantly using this tool and it's making everything easier for me and you kind of like think about like, well, how could I exist without this? And it just kind of gives you a nice like kind of like refresh into like playing the game again after you've kind of seen everything. Because you're not going to be in God mode because knowing from soft, it's going to be like, oh, we Still turn hard. off all the red indicators, so you're not going to be able to know when those come. <laughs> that, that game would be a mess without those. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. Um, but closing thoughts is I really like it. Go play the game, uh, Bradley. Just stop playing whatever you're playing right now. Go play no, Sekiro. No, I want to play. Blood, I want to play Bloodborne yeah. instead. we're doing a prediction shit sheet for Bloodborne. I already. Oh, okay, that's right. Yeah. Well, yeah. We'll, go play Bloodborne instead. Bloodborne's real fun. You just play Bloodborne. <laughs> Bloodborne's so, one of those games I think you could give someone, and it stands really good on its own. Like it's pretty perfect in its game design ways. God, it's I would say. It's fucking perfect. Anyways, um, I think this was the textbook reason why you go listen to the Roundabout Cast instead of your any other podcast, because me and Joe. Had completely different opinions, but you know what? We're still friends in the end, and that's what matters. I fucking hate you, Willard. Yeah! All right, All right. great time. So we're back. Um, <laughs> the great secret of this podcast is about to be revealed. 
Um, bam, bam. If you've been wondering for ages now why Tyler is the special guest despite being so close in the friend group, it is because Tyler is oftentimes hard to reach. Well, I, I don't think that's an understatement at all. Um, <laughs> you were about to go, oh, that's kind of ah, nah. No, you, you know what? I, I think I'm right, and I think others would agree with me. Tyler kind of likes to observe the chat rather than participate in any conversation until yeah. he absolutely wants to. I'm an um, absolute lurker. We had, yeah, a he slack, is, we had a Slack group and a Discord group, and Tyler just shows up, and it's like, hey, guys, let's let's – Let's do the first episode of the podcast today. And Tyler's like, what, what are we talking about? <laughs> but What's but the main reason is also we're like, okay, everyone pick something you kind of want to talk about today. And to, till right now, Tyler hasn't decided what he wants to talk about. And this until he can prove himself worthy by bringing something beforehand, he's going to be the special guest. So with that in mind, uh, let's move into the next segment, which is Tyler's mailbag. Uh <laughs> Go ahead, I, Tyler. I, I, I had the mail back today because it got shipped to the wrong address. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> so, so this this letter. Wait, comes, wait, wait, wait. Short... Hold, hold on, hmm? hold on. Okay. I, I gotta, I gotta do the like, the intro bit. Oh, okay. He has a jingle. <laughs> Hi, kids. This is Tyler's mailbag. Today, Yay! my friend Postman Joseph is gonna read me a letter. <laughs> what you got for me today, Joseph? <laughs> This letter comes from Cynthia Gluestein. Does it? On episode yes. one? <laughs> okay. Yeah, on episode one. She just knew. Just sent the letter straight to my house. Great. All right. Dear Roundabout Podcast, I recently moved to a new state with my family, and I'm worried that <laughs> about meeting new friends, meeting new people, and making new friends. I wasn't very popular at my previous school. People made fun of me for eating glue and rubbing glitter all over myself in the bathroom. That's hot. This... This really made my teacher mad on test day, since the glitter would fall off and onto the test paper, making it incredibly flamboyant. What are some tips and tricks to make some new friends in a new state? <laughs> well, little... Is it Samantha? Cynthia. <laughs> <laughs> well, little Cynthia, I hear that eating glue can be sometimes bad for you. Instead, try to eat the cool sandwiches that they sell in the cafeteria. But make sure you always ninja run to the cafeteria to get there first to make sure you grab a sandwich. Thanks, Another Tyler. cool thing is stay away from drugs. Drugs are bad. Instead, get in with all the cool kids by selling them drugs. That way, you don't do them yourself and then you make a dollar. That's what all the pharmaceutical companies do. Big Pharma. Big Pharma Tyler. <laughs> I would never do drugs. Yeah. No. Lastly, remember this, Cynthia. That teacher of yours probably didn't finish her four-year degree somewhere. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's probably 22, and you'll be there someday, too. <laughs> that rhymes, so you know it's true. Oh, God. That rhyme too. Don't oh, worry about her right now. She'll get what's coming to her. Just don't worry about it. Oh, well, that's all the time we have for Tyler's mailbag. <laughs> Thank you, Tyler. Um, now, Tyler, I'm going to force you to f pick something else to also talk about. Uh, why don't you tell us about your fucking ran running anime that you like? Mm. Run, uh, run with the wind, bullseye. Yeah, yeah let's, talk let's talk about run with the wind. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm. you know, I'm actually down to, I think, only like three animes i'm watching right now like spring hit really well for me and definitely the winner of probably like let's see it's 2019 right now uh this is probably when did one punch man come out is that 2016 two years ago yeah yeah that was three years ago yeah. i think no it was like the, the anime at least was the it anime Ugh. i'm not doing math it was a long time ago um, so this, uh, Run With The Wind is an anime about, it's a sports anime, so let's start off with, like, sports animes often have, like, really great character detail because it focuses on people and, like, teamwork and building and everything. Some animes, uh, sports animes have really weird things in them, like, they do have anime, like, gimmicks where it's like, oh, he can pass the ball really hard, or Kuroko. all of his pitches are... 89 per uh 89 mile per hour curveballs and it's like impossible to hit and it's like they all like they have these character gimmicks and everything and run with the wind doesn't have any of that it has like 
it, it involves around a main character who is he's his freshman in college and he spent all of his college like uh it, the, the anime starts off he spent all of his college like loan money that he got from the government on gambling and he lost it all and he lost his place to live um he used to run in high school and he got on like a bad stroke of luck and one day he steals from a supermarket and of course the guy who's working the supermarket you know he's not going to catch this guy who's like sprinting at collegiate levels um and uh so he's sprinting running away with like some bread or something and this guy starts riding with him next to him on a bicycle and he's like do you like to run and then that's how it all starts so he joins up with this house in this like run down really like like really run down house and there's 10 other people in it and then the guy who was riding the bike is like all right i've assembled 10 random people now we're all gonna go run a super relay marathon and then nobody else in the house runs except for him and the the guy on the bicycle and the guy who is stealing the bread and everybody else is like what and Mm -hmm. so it becomes a story of convincing them to run and like how they can like it and everything and how it can promote character growth. It's really well animated. Um, and it shows a lot to like college, like what college can be like for a lot of people to where you have these students who have goals and they're just going to class, you know, not everyone. And it's like, some of them are really like career focused and career oriented. Like I have to get a job outside of like right as soon as college ends, like nothing else matters. And showing how doing something as simple as running can kind of like take away some of that stress and really like build friendships. Um, and I, I took it really personally. I'm not going to lie. Cause I, I used to run a uh, track back in high school way back in the day. Um, and I did long distance too. I sucked at long distance running. I, I could not do it. I, I just did it every year though because I like to run and I ran from like I, I ran pretty much all year round. I ran in the fall, which was long distance, and then the spring and the summer were track. But I ran with this group of kids that I like had nothing in common with. Everybody did different things, but when we were all running together, we we looked like a group of people who hung out every single day and like night. Like, we had known each other, and we were all best friends. And it's just, it was really cool to see them, like, convey that magic of what it's like to be on a team and, like, an organized part uh, or part of an organization where everybody has such dynamic interests and uh, can, can, like, get along with each other. And it's, like, even if they're not getting along, how they're getting along by not getting along, like, when you say F you to Willer, you know, it's like, oh yeah, you know, like fuck you, Willer. And yeah. then Willer's just like, F fuck you, you too. <laughs> but uh it's it, man, every episode like made me cry just because it was like it and it wasn't I don't even know why, honestly. I think it just connected with me on that level. But man, it it just told some good stories each episode. Each episode there was a problem for one of the 10 students to overcome, whether it had to do with like family matters, their education, girlfriends, uh, jobs, like just the past coming up and like whatever baggage this character had. And it's it's really short. I think it's only 24 episodes long, uh, but really hot spring anime. I think it was like a book from like 1993 or something. Yeah. Like one of those short no- novellas from like, the 20th century era, you know, late nine, uh, late 19th century, uh, mm-hmm. late 20th century, some <laughs> crap like that. Century, yeah, 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 late 19th century. But yeah, it's uh, it was really good, and the short, like the story wraps up really well, really nicely. It doesn't drag anything on. There's no filler. Um, the the surprising thing about this anime, the real kicker, no hot spring arc. Yo. No hot spring. They go to the mountains at one point, but no hot spring. Crazy. And, and that was like a first time thing for me in anime, you know? Like, oh, where's the hot spring arc? Oh, there's no hot spring arc. Oh, man, what's going on here? Truly groundbreaking right there. <laughs> and, and I think that's just a testament to show where we've come in 2019 and what the new animes are trying to throw out there. That That's really cool. I think um, I really like your personal connection with it. That might be why you liked it so much, but I, I also watched an episode. Uh, Bradley was there too. I don't think Joe was there. 
And it seemed like really quality, so I'm actually interested in checking it out at some point. The animation itself was like really good. I very much like the setup of uh, the ten boys and trying to get them all to run. I feel like that's ripe for some character development and like, oh, I want to. Everyone's gonna have their own reason to run, and it's gonna reflect of their personalities and stuff. There's a there's a character, and I like to talk about this character because it's probably sadly the one that we relate to the most. Rip. Um, there's a character called Prince, and they show him his room, and he's got from floor to ceiling manga just stacked and organized everywhere in the room bookshelves just on the floor um and he just reads manga all day and night he is a small frail person he's just scrawny and and i know we eat well we're not like that but still like i I know people like him you know Mm -hmm. and he can't run he he can't do anything physical and the way that he gets him to start running is he threatens to kick him out and like he everybody's threatened kind of like to get kicked out of the house if they don't run um but especially for this character he's one of the first ones to start is because he's gonna lose all of his manga and all no. of his like collection you know <laughs> and he's just like no so he has to start running and he's doing like absolutely awful and then like once the main character starts to like enjoy the running and everything he realizes like oh hey like this guy, he, and he runs really, like, you ever seen, like, uh, you ever watched Friends where, like, Phoebe runs with her arms, like, flailing out <laughs> to the side? Yes. He, he kind of runs like that, but then, like, he realizes, oh, he needs to put his arms in front of him, and then he's, like, reading one day, and then he's like, oh, try reading and running at the same time. Whoa. And so, like, he has to always, like, one guy runs in front of him and holds the manga up so he can read it. And then, like, he starts, like, keeping his head up and everything and, like, keeping his body straight so he can read his manga while he runs. And I was like, oh, dude, you know what? That's, like, that's some weird stuff that I can actually see happening because when it comes to form and running, you do some crazy things to try and get it to be right. It's it's. That sounds like a very cute solution to to that, like, little character problem. Yeah, he didn't gain any superpowers or go, like, easy, like... No. Now, that being said... Super Saiyan 3... There is a place for super-powered uh, sports anime, and you and I both know this. And that's called Kuroko no Basuke! There's a, there's a couple of others, too. I, I do like me my share of sports uh, manga, so I, I'm down to check this out. Tyler, can we get a, a rating and who you would recommend this in the, in the group? Who do you think would like this among us? Uh, I'm going to go with Joe, actually. Whoa. Ooh, I, I no. think Joe would like it for the character development and the bonding I, that I, I character has. I'm, I'm, I, I don't doubt that at all because, well, number one, I also did football all four years of high school and three years of middle school. So I basically did football for seven years. Uh, so I understand that concept of uh, – and, and camp. Camp was another big thing where it's like you have this concept of like – brothers in arms you're in the you're in the mud you're in the ditches and you're working every day with these people yeah. and like you may not go home with Two them days. afterwards yeah you may not go home with them afterwards you may not all have the same thing but like when you've been in a situation with somebody and like you're like remember that one time where our fucking camp coordinator called us out in the middle of the night and told us I let all the chickens go. I need you to catch all the chickens before 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> what is this anime bullshit? <laughs> this is what happened to me at camp. Like, it was just like, what? <laughs> I was in football, and they didn't do that to us. They just punished us till we were sick. This <laughs> was this <laughs> was our <laughs> camp. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, it's, it's definitely on my watch list of something to watch. I just have kaiji to get through first for my exercise anime and just... It might it might bump up to my anime that I just actually watch, but it's it's definitely yeah, on my list. We'll talk about Kaiji in the future. I I, yeah. I was hoping you'd say your football coordinators told you all to learn the Rasengan overnight, but you know, catching chickens is cool too. That also happened. Oh, that's that's dope. <laughs> our, our football coordinators just made it like okay, we didn't have turf football fields. We had like this really old dirt slash almost grass football field. And they were just like, hey, do bear crawls until your hands are bleeding from split stickers. Oh, man. We had to – we we had the, the AstroTurf. And what they don't tell you about the AstroTurf is that there's these, like, little <laughs> tiny, like, 
uh, fake dirt molecules in the ground. You mean the that turf? Were, yeah, that's what it, the, it, the turf. It's, it's all of it. And, yeah, <laughs> um, but it's they're actually like sharp. Like yes. they're legitimately sharp. And hot. And they're just like, yeah, go um, go do bear crawls, like as a punishment for being two minutes late to your practice because your shoe just happened to untie or someone threw your fucking cleat up on the locker or something. I don't know. I just want to say that because of my weird body proportions, I was a god at bear crawls. And I would, <laughs> I would, I was so good at them that one time the coaches made everyone else run extra, and I felt bad. <laughs> they're like, they're like the Silva over here is a defensive uh, end, and he's doing bear crawls better than everyone. Everyone run more. And everyone just looked at me like I was a fucking devil. It's bad. Oh, that's that, that's a good feeling though. Like you've Loki, like that's like the one uplift. That's like the best compliment you can get from a grade school coach. Yeah. Is when uh they punish other kids in your name. Jesus. <laughs> well, see, the reason it was good for me is because I was a tight end. So I worked out with the linemen, right? And I'm the only one who's like less than 250 pounds. <laughs> so I, whenever we're running, I'd always be at the front. And coach would be like, what the fuck? Why is Bradley so far ahead of everybody, everybody else? Of course else he is, out. coach. <laughs> you we, had, uh, be. we had this interesting thing where we had like at the end of like we had – athletics seventh period and then when we'd have practice right after so it's like they like not all the kids had practice so they had to let us go inside at one point like class had to end at one point and at the end of every class we would run a 400 we would run a lap around the track and it was like all right just go run a lap you know like everybody run a lap but they would do it by football standards so all the non-linemen would run first and that includes like it was really weird how they selected people too, because not everybody played football. So it's like, if you're under 200, <laughs> you don't run first. You're a wide receiver you know? kind. That, yeah, it was really just like, if you did play football, that you're going to be in the back with those guys. And they would do times and it's like, all right, if you don't run, if you don't run the lap in under a minute and 25 seconds, you got to run another one. Jesus. I'm and, and then, yeah. And then like, all the time they would just everybody would always have to run another one but like i was like i i ran track since i was probably like 11 starting in like the texas summer so that's like 100 plus degree weather like i i ran track a lot so like the other time i was in middle school i i was fast and uh so like i would always be competing with one of the other kids for like first or second or whatever and like sometimes they would be like, "All right, hey, what's our time you want to get today?" And I think everybody in this podcast knows that I have really extreme opinions and ideas. Yeah, you do. So that time would get cut from like one twenty-five to one thirteen because I was just a devil child and I like to see everybody suffer a little bit. Yeah, you do. <laughs> and that like, like honestly, in retrospect, I'd probably still do the same thing because nobody ever watched him run the second lap, so a lot of people just kind of like walked it. But you know, like I, I could like play it off as something like, "Oh yeah, I was trying to help do people do physical therapy," or I, I can't play it off as that. I was just a mean spirited person who just <laughs> liked to watch people run two laps around a track, like sue me, you know? Fucking devil child over here. <laughs> I, I, w I was the mean kid. This, that, uh, that was the most mean I could ever be in grade school was just forcing people to run a second lap. That's actually bad, man. I don't know. As a as a non <laughs> as a non long long distance guy, I always I've always been a sprinter at best. Like you, you hurt me. Um, I, I, I'm sure I scarred a lot of people, and I, I'll apologize for that. I, I I didn't mean to. You know, I was young. I was running at the time. I was doing a lot of reckless things. Now, Tyler, why don't you give us a, fi a final score on uh, Running with the Wind? Or is it Run with the Wind? Run with the Wind. Uh, um, you know what? If we're, what? What are we doing? Are we doing our five scores? Let's do the five-point scale. Let's do the five-point scale? Dude, yeah. honestly, solid four out of five. It was above average, especially, like, the animation and the, like, uh, the, the, just the audio really was a big one for me. Ooh. Yeah, it was nice. Uh there was a couple little side characters that didn't distract too much from the story. There was like kind of this constant buildup in the entire back of it. Uh, like there was this other narrative going on with this other character the entire time that you didn't know if it was going to be problematic. And then during like the big event of the show, 
during one of the climax parts, something different entirely slaps you out of like left field and you're like, holy shit, I can't believe that happened. That I can absolutely see that happening. I do remember you straight up like losing your shit for a little bit there. You're, like you were watching episodes, you would message us and we're like, we don't know what Tyler's talking about, but he's going through it right now. Oh my god, it, it was oof. So there um you imagine the worst thing that could happen on a running day uh and, and that happened it, it was tragic so there like, were those kids there were uh landmines on the field yeah that, that's a harsh one that, that happens but not during uh the main climax the event. Event. It, happens, it happens during oh, a man. different one <laughs> okay um all right there you have it run with the wind good anime uh more like done with the wind <laughs> And okay, so next up we have the Willer Game of Thrones Echo Chamber Hour. So, Ew. my hour we give you five minutes. <laughs> Willer is uh, the only person that keeps up <laughs> with Game of Thrones. I would keep up with Game of Thrones, but I don't have HBO. I've already been spoiled on everything anyway, so I really, it's like no care for me. I don't know if Tyler does anything with it. I don't know if Bradley does anything with it. Not about the medieval so dramas. It's Willer's Game of Thrones Hour, a.k.a. the Adult Video Awards. <laughs> uh, it's his favorite point. For the past 12 years in a row. Yo, there you got some good uh, shadowed out uh, vaginas and penises, okay? The best yeah, but so does JoJo's, all right? <laughs> You're not wrong. Okay, so real quick. Um, I'm with the three people on the planet that haven't watched Game of Thrones yet, so I just want to... <laughs> I want to just talk about how big of a deal it is that season eight aired yesterday. Um, this is the final season of game of Thrones. So I want to preface by saying I hate medieval fiction. I think it's such Ugh. a boring setting. I am so done with the weapons and the set designs and the character designs and the fucking wizards and rangers and, and clerics and shit. I, I really don't like that setting. Um, however, I really like game of Thrones. So, and he really likes boobs. Well, that's neither here nor there. So, okay. um, that should really tell you that this is kind of different from a medieval drama because this is more of a political actiony drama. Um, if you don't know the structure of Game of Thrones, it follows the books for the first five ish seasons, and then season six and seven and eight are branching off from the book because George R. R. Martin is is probably not going to finish them. God, um, what's wrong with him? Yeah, it's kind of... Bradley, you know a little bit about the pain of unfinished series. So. Oh, I want to talk about it. <laughs> uh, at a different time, maybe. So, Rep Hunter x Hunter. <laughs> well, no, that, that's not even a Bradley series. That's an us. Hunter x Hunter height is... That's a... Honey, Hunter height... <laughs> I'm getting all huffy. <laughs> Hunter x Hunter hiatuses are like rookie hiatuses. I uh, neither none of us read Vagabond, which is apparently the serious one. But anyway, you know what? Fair enough. Um, so Game of Thrones. Here's the selling points of Game of Thrones. It has really good plot. Um, it's it keeps you on your toes. Bradley, you like when anyone can die. Uh, yeah. Anyone can die in Game of Thrones, and they really can up until like near. Like, this, this last season, it's like, okay, I know some people won't die because they'll probably die if they do die in the last season. But aside from that, everyone was fair game up until that point. Um, it's got really good character development. It's got uh, really good acting and writing. Uh, it's really funny. It's really edgy. It's really dark when it wants to be. And I know Bradley likes edge. And I'm Joe likes boy. funny. Um, so... Yeah, like it's it's also really good throughout. So it, it as as uh between us we know that me and Bradley's favorite show is Breaking Bad. Um Oh my god. This doesn't really this isn't Breaking Bad level. I won't set you up for that. Um but it's probably my second or third favorite T V show. And that's even considering um it gets a lot of flack because there's so many people watching it that it, it's both room to a lot of praise and a lot of criticism. So one of the criticisms with the show is, uh, especially last season, imagine a show that moves at like a really slow pace a lot of the time. Um, characters talk a lot. They travel to locations. It takes several episodes, and adventures happen. You. Yeah. So when you get to season seven, you only have a core cast of characters left for various reasons, a lot of them being death, but there's also other reasons. Um, 
And the show, and the season seven has seven episodes, and it's like, okay, we gotta fucking wrap up this multi-plot threaded huge story. So things got way faster paced, and a lot of people didn't like that. It was it was pretty jarring compared to the other seasons, where people were moving between locations really fast. But even that season had a really a lot of really good moments. So I'll, I'll still defend season seven. There's yeah. one bad season in in Breaking Bad, and it's season five. That season's trash. Can't defend that. There's no that. bad seasons in Breaking Bad. There, there fucking aren't. Wait, did I say Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones? Yeah, you said Breaking Bad. I was like, there's oh, no God. bad seasons in Breaking Bad. They're all fine. <laughs> no, season five of Game of Thrones is bad. Breaking Bad is good every time. Um, every time. And, yeah, the, I'll, I'll be talking about this as the season goes on. Uh, you'll probably catch it in at least like another podcast or so. Um, but the episode yesterday was really good. Uh, they covered a lot of ground. Uh, it was a very introductory episode. This season's only six episodes, and some of them will be longer. So, yeah, that's... This that's... is the uh, season premiere, right, episode that you're talking about? Yeah, yesterday was the season premiere episode, and there's five more. And this is the more. final season? Yeah. So now's a, a good time to catch up if, if you're gonna. Yeah, um, and for anyone out there planning on bombing my house because I haven't watched Game of Thrones yet, um, I will eventually uh most like i feel like i it's kind of my duty i mean it's a cultural phenomenon so at some point i will have to check it out uh i specifically <laughs> think bradley would like it because the tone bradley likes either really cute shit or uh edgy dark shit where anyone yeah, can die i'm on and... a slider between like kirby and berserk it's so... not a slider it's no a yeah you're right it's boolean. not a slider it's at a all it's, a... it's like imagine it's a bridge boolean. but the bridge has two planks one at the beginning and one at the end of the bridge yeah that's all you have to work with with bradley that's what we got that's here. his taste everything in between you might as well just throw in the pit you, you, there's no guessing anything in between yeah. um so... i will say for game of thrones i have a friend and she is uh, she she is not at all kind of like part of like that the nerdy kind of culture or can, can really get behind it kind of deal. The most she can get behind was Harry Potter, but even then she kind of just like took it in and just went along with it. She didn't really like get into that really fan basey like down like really trying to knit and grit and like figure things out. And the past three months she's been catching up with Game of Thrones. Like she hadn't watched it at all, and she. It's like her new favorite thing, and she is not a person that can like that really gets into these deep fan base um, titles. Like so I someone wanna... who would be classified as a normal person. Yeah, <laughs> some might say. Yeah. Some might say, but I think like the Game of Thrones really like kind of broke down ground, like really broke into ground of like saying like we can tell compelling stories that are very human stories in a non-normal setting and it opens the door up to like having people like accept into more crazy or uh, okay. just but more bizarre settings and out there kind of tells saying like oh we can really tell a story about, about a family or a brotherhood bond between two dudes racing across the united states desert trying to collect all the parts of jesus christ <laughs> all right <laughs> had to do it you had to do it didn't you <laughs> All right, real quick before we transition into the big meat. Um, <laughs> Did you like my segue? Big meat? <laughs> That's big a, meat? You should have waited for me to talk because that was a perfect segue. Uh, just real quick, yeah, it's amazing how Game of Thrones can appeal to a very normal crowd, um, people who don't really like um, stuff that's really deep and and uh, it's nerdy and like as fantastical as that. Uh, Game of Thrones is a really good at applying. Um, Appealing to them, partially probably because of the boobs, but real realistically, I know really like people who don't get into stuff like we do, but they're into Game of Thrones more than I am. Like the most dude bro person in my high school, I see him post like Snapchats about it, so it it's pretty serious. Um, all right, let's talk about uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part Seven: Steel Ball Run. And we'll probably bring up JoJo's Bizarre Adventure like every other second. It's weak. <laughs> Breath. In general. Uh, we are watching the anime live, but um, me, Bradley, and Joe uh, have read up to part seven, and me and Joe have are up to date with Joe Jolion. Uh, four more days, by the way, uh, until the next mm. chapter. However, this poses a problem because Tyler is watching the anime live. Now, Tyler doesn't... Anime really... only. It's tis tis. I, yeah. I just happen to already know everything about JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, though, so it's he, okay. He immediately went on a wiki dive, and he he's always been not super caring about 
the spoilers, and he doesn't like JoJo's as much as us. Uh, but he do, he like follows along, and we we try to watch uh, episodes with uh, each other every week. Um, so to that end, let's sidestep some spoilers, and let's we're gonna talk about spoilers, but we're gonna kind of uh, swerve around them with our horses. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm. Like here's the thing: we could actually. E- like it wouldn't even be hard. We could easily talk about Steel Ball Run for you just three hours. Just, arc. Oh, yeah. just Steel Ball Run, not just, not JoJo's. Yeah. Just the oh. what's a hundred and eight chapters of Steel Ball Run, or something like that. It's something like, like that. it's ninety five, I think. But, yeah. Like okay, one more bonus thing. Steel Ball Run is like a life changing event for Joe. Um, it is his favorite part. Brad, we're talking about this now because Bradley just finished it like uh, three or four weeks ago. Very recently. Um, we wanted to start the podcast partially to talk about this and have it recorded somewhere. Um, it's my second favorite part. So and... among all of us, we really like this part of yeah. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Much um, like Joe, it is my favorite section of JoJo's and by no small margin either. Though I do like the other ones. That's just how good Steel Ball Run is. But, all right, let's talk. Bradley, why don't you lead us here? What What are some of your favorite characters and arcs and themes of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part yeah. 7? So, like I said, you know, there's a million things that we could pick apart Steel Ball Run for and and have it all be positive things. Um, one particular thing I really felt the need to talk about was the motivation for Johnny's journey in Steel Ball Run, how that relates to how death is treated in Steel Ball Run, and how that in turn relates to kind of the take we can have on Johnny's morality. So to talk about Johnny's motivation for his adventure, all of the other JoJo's Bizarre Adventure protagonists are either... Their motivation is directly involved with either stopping a murderer or saving somebody like a family member um which, sometimes that involves stopping a murderer yeah like both <laughs> like stardust crusaders is both yeah. um all all the all of their motivations parts one through six there's kind of an immediately good consequence for the world around them if they are able to accomplish their objective either they will have saved somebody um they will stop a mass murderer a little, Johnny, a little debatable with six, but we'll get that in the, a little bit, in the yeah. big episode for six. That's oof, that'll be a big Johnny. One. I believe has the most self centric goal so far. His his primary thing is, in his words, he wants to get his life back to zero. Meaning, he wants to get out of the negatives which he views himself in. Yes. He wants to walk again. He will do anything to walk again. he's paraplegic <laughs> by the way yeah, yeah. and how, how did he become a paraplegic Ooh, well by his own shitty actions that he do you want a very direct spoiler or do you want me to walk around it no no this is for the audience man you can't you can't you can't just not tell them anything <laughs> so big theme in in part seven is essentially you take an action and the consequences of your action can either end up on your side of the court or on the other side of the yes, court. It's a big theme that, that kind of follows throughout the entire um, the entire part and really talks about, like, you know, when given the chance to give someone the ball to really kind of give them the choice of what your fate's going to be, you shouldn't do it. Like, it, it's you, you should keep your fate in your own hands. You should maintain your own fate. You shouldn't just leave it up to chance. And it happens multiple times in the character's and it becomes their downfall. It can be both their downfall, and it also be the thing that like makes them win in the end. And so Johnny makes a very kind of selfish decision that ends up um, biting him in the ass it, and causes him to become paraplegic. And he and he suffers because of it. And he realizes that like he's just that he has cho- he took a, he made a decision, and he can't believe this has happened to him. Kind and of. that that's even a little more mature than it is. Like Johnny yeah. was a fucking little shit, and yeah. and he pays for it by becoming a paraplegic because another person didn't like his attitude, basically. And hmm. um, getting on that, like those panels where he's in the fucking hospital after he's been paralyzed are fucking nightmare fuel. 
They are it very is. disturbing, um, and it really shows why why he wants to walk. His life just hit rock bottom and then went further down, which is why he describes himself in the negatives. His life is completely different from what it was from when he could walk. And that really fits into the theme and his motivations of wanting yeah. to walk again. He 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 really just wants to walk again, and this is why I find it really. That's what this is why I find his approach to enemies who show up very interesting. Um, Steel Ball Run it dresses very clearly the fact that they are killing these enemies they come across and that this might not be okay. Um, and a lot of the other parts, there's lots of nuance to the uh, villain of the weeks, as someone might call them. Um, and for most of these fights, it's pretty apparent that, okay, these people are here, here to kill us. If I don't kill them, they're going to kill me. That's the only way this is going to end. Especially in part uh, five. Yeah. And even if it, that's not the case, the enemy they're fighting is pretty objectively um Bad. evil which you know there's more nuance to that um but that's the case for a lot of the villain of the weeks and steel ball run we run into disagreements with um some of our protagonists on whether a certain person should die or not which i like seeing that um i like seeing that of jet um because gyro is kind of in a state where he he is okay with killing someone but only if that if it's necessary for them to progress on their objective and, well, our, and he really has yeah. to build up to that moment like that is a very pivotal arc where he realizes oh, yeah. that about himself up until mm. that point he's not really willing to do it and from that point on he's like okay i i this is the true man's world as he calls it and i will kill yeah. if i must but there's a distinction there he will kill if he must <laughs> which is where bradley's getting to yeah. Yeah. And and the thing is like we almost have like when this when this moment happens, it it's almost like a flip in our characters. Because Johnny mm -hmm. at the time John Johnny's very scared. He's 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 paraplegic, he doesn't have a lot of power. John Gyro's the one that has the steel balls and has the spin and kinda of has the ability to protect him. And so up until this point when we get to this point, Johnny has finally developed his own stand. Um, stands are essentially like the power oh, system in JoJo's, JoJo's yeah. and so it, it so this is you know it Johnny getting a stand is his first step to getting back to zero. It's giving him power, whereas whereas Jira along the first half of this journey has his power and protection, and so Jiro comes to the conclusion of that like I have the ability to do this, but it doesn't mean I should. Whereas Johnny then ends up growing to like. Because I can, I should. Because it's the best way. To, it's the only way to get my goal, and it's it, it, be, it drives our two main characters almost against each other I, ideologically when we see them interact and how they approach situations. Yeah, Johnny is much more. He he's much more ready to kill than Gyro is, and the reason I find this particularly interesting in Steel Ball Run, because we I I think I think we've seen JoJo's protagonists before who are very ready to kill if they have to or even want to the reason i find it supremely interesting for johnny is because of his motivation where if we were to look at some kind of alignment scale if you look if i peg johnny as a chaotic neutral and the reason i do this is because with his alignment of my objective is to walk again let's look let's imagine a good alignment johnny he runs into his first enemy who isn't even necessarily maybe out to kill him. Maybe they just want the corpse part. Give me the corpse part. You can go. Let's imagine this. Yeah. A good alignment, Johnny would say, man, there's nothing in the entire world I want more than to walk again. That's all I want, but it's oh. not worth being a murderer. Over. He'd say, I figure he out some other path to it. Yeah. This Johnny <laughs> does, does Johnny. not even consider this. Yeah. The primary objective is always the same. However... It, however... <laughs> oh, uh, that would be true, except for what I consider the best arc in Part 7, oh God. Sugar Mountain. Oh my god, where, I love Sugar Mountain. Whew, at the end of it, Johnny has to make a decision between Gyro and furthering his goal to walk. 
Yes. And then this really beautiful scene in the snow. First of all, the whole arc is it's got a really fun stand where they have to trade items or else they become part of a tree. Um, and while that happening, there's 11 men who can fuse into each other shooting at them. It's fucking bu- – action-wise, it's already fucking bonkers. But it's then, crazy. <laughs> but then this ending where one of the 11 men survives and I forgot the context but like uh, – Johnny can trade the body part, and that will finish the Sugar Mountain stand's uh, condition on them. Is that how it works? Yes. Right. Yeah. So, so they the the way they get the body parts is they essentially had to trade it. One way or another, they they end up like with a plethora of like goods, and they figure out that they can. It's a corpse part, so they trade in some like old animal ears or something to get these, um, the ears for the for the corpse. And so you have, and so they're giving everything away, but they never consider these corpse parts as like something with value to it because they're not money, but they are wanted. And so they have to trade the item for something of a like a, a fair trade in someone else's eye. You can't just gam- you can't just like throw them away. You can't just like chair like give them away like for charity. You have to have a transaction between two people. And in the end there, um, Johnny trades it for a bottle of whiskey, right? Wine. Wine? But yeah. And that leads to one of the most touching moments in Part 7 for me, where Gyro walks up, and Johnny's just defeated in the snow, and it's like the first the first time so far that he's had to really trade something, like trade his goal for, for someone else, because yeah. really, at this point, he really loves and cares about Gyro, right? Yeah. Um, and then Gyro is just like, hey, man, let's let's share that alcohol. It'll keep us warm. And, like, they just have this tender moment in the snow. And it's just like, yeah. oh, my heart. It's, they're so well written it's, as uh, a duo. It's the first time. You're right. It's the first time we saw Johnny make a compromise on achieving his goal for anything. And it really speaks to um, how their friendship has grown. Because we have now established the hi- – we have established a new hierarchy of Johnny's objectives – he is willing he he puts walking again over killing he will kill to walk again but he will not abandon his friend gyro and and he also like it's a little bit less of dire of a situation but in wired um he does the most to protect gyro uh it's a little less pure than in the sugar mountain one because there's a corpse part involved again and he can get it if he fights a uh, pork pie hat kid or whatever and he's also in the progress of learning the spins, so, like, he needs Gyro. But it, it harkens back to that, where, like, yeah, he's going to fight for Gyro because he, he from the beginning, he does kind of like him. Let's, uh, to, to move the discussion a bit, um, so, so Bradley really likes Gyro's motivation. We all do. Uh, to involve Tyler in a little bit, uh, and Hunter, Hunter fans, it's very akin to a... Kalua gone situation, and if you've read the, if you've read the Chimera Ant arc, you kind of know what I'm referring to. But uh, let's let's talk about Funny Valentine a little bit. Yeah, let's talk about Funny Valentine. My babe. Um. So if I may, no, I may not. particularly like um, part six and seven's protagonists, Pucci and Valentine. Antagonist, you mean? Antagonist, yeah, no protagonist. <laughs> well, you know, in they, some circles, some people would not argue with that. Um, I'm, I'm with those people. Actually, yeah, yeah it's, all that Ooh, Tyler. Shoot. No, in his wiki dive, Tyler went up to me. He's like, "Are you are you sure that Valentine isn't the good guy?" I was like, "I'm pretty sure," but I could see why you'd be confused. Yeah, the reason I really like these two antagonists is because um, I I think the the core conflict of uh these parts that is related to these antagonists are kind of philosophical issues that people have argued about for actually thousands of years um and to be more specific if we're talking about valentine's it's that you know valentine he he does want to ascend into a place of power of absolute control um, and that's kind of a message that a lot of people would immediately be like, I don't like the sound of that. But the reason he wants to do this is because of a pretty firm confidence and belief that by gathering these corpse parts and ascending 
to this and taking on this leadership role over humanity where he's this new superior the napkin can ensure peace and he might be able to actually that's the thing it's kind of a question of is peace worth it if the cost for that peace is i guess a absolute this dictatorship um and i don't know if dictator gives the right connotation to what's going on here but it's it is close. an absolute rule yeah essentially in valentine's plan everyone but america would suffer and america would have the ultimate power in this case they would become the ultimate leadership um and he he likens it to grabbing the napkin at a dinner table if you grab the left one Everyone in the dinner table is forced to also grab the left one or else they're going to grab someone else's. So you set a precedent through initiative and power. Um, and an initiative kind of ties into the my analogy of the tennis ball thing too. So that's kind of interesting. But that that's basically Valentine's um, goal in this. And on top of that, he's just such an – he's an entertaining villain with a great design, a really cool stand. Um, there's really good fights involving him. Yes. He's all right. <laughs> that's, that's not true. He's more than all right. Joe, I'm sure you got some Valentine things to say. more than good. <laughs> the, the thing about Valentine is he's also kind of like, when when you mentioned before that to Johnny, it's it's gyro than the corpus parts, where where nothing will like, like he will do whatever he can to, to get these corpus parts to walk again. But he won't let gyro go he will not like leave gyro to die he will not like he will sacrifice what he has to make sure gyro lives like there's a significant love whereas valentine is a very much a cold calculating perspective on that where it's just like this is the right thing to do and on paper it is he's the president of the united states of america his job is to protect the united states of america that's literally his job and and so, it, it's one of those Machiavellians do the mean do, do the means justify the ends kind of thing, um, or do the ends justify the means? Right. Um, yeah. And so we we in, we end up the, like my favorite scene in all of JoJo's happens Ooh. and have this direct conflict where where they're staring each other down, and Valentine promises Johnny something, and johnny thinks about it and says i can't give that up or i can't take that offer because i know it's wrong because i know that it's not right for in my sense of morals on paper it's it on paper yeah okay but that doesn't mean you've, you're doing the right thing and so you you have this point where like that shows a real difference of hitting back to zero um mm. for johnny and that he's able to just kind of overcome the idea of like there's only kind of like there's there's an end like the end only matters it's only about walking it's only about you know being the best and that's kind of a direct conflict with like everyone else like diego is like his one thing is like he has to be the best at the horse race like For money. it's hmm? he's he's really big into money diego so th- there's yeah, that aspect it, too yeah it's For, like everyone has for a good reason, he's into money. Yeah. And, like, everyone has these, like, goals. And the idea is, like, what are you willing to sacrifice for your goals? And and to Johnny, Johnny realizes getting back to zero is not, isn't, you know, sacrifice everything for those goals, but realizing what you have to, what you can and cannot sacrifice. Because that's just, that makes zero for you. Because you, you know where you stand, mm-hmm. essentially. And, and He said you know, stand. Ah! <laughs> And for Valentine, it's it's he's God. Valentine's such a cool character, in my opinion. He's one of my favorite villains. He he just Same. everything he does. He's top three. Is for me. so yeah, and his his stand is so goddamn cool, and kind of really reflects that whole like hive mindset of just determination, of being able to mm. just have the willpower to from wherever you are to do what you need. And like it's it's this kind of really scary idea that someone with a strong enough desire to have something will not stop until they are like put into the ground. And it's just like you know he's willing he he talks about all the people that die in the race as literal pawns on a test board. And he's just like oh I, like they don't matter 
because I won the game. Like, I won the game. It doesn't matter how many pieces I lost. I still won. That's his whole big deal. And for Gyro, he has the one piece that he cannot lose. And so that's kind of like where they are against each other. But I think Valentine's more of a better foil for Gyro than he is for Johnny. Um, How so? Because because Gyro, at the very start, I think, no, it's like it's what, chapter 10? We go into Gyro's like Motivation. first backstory. And like we really learn why he's in this race, and the race, and the reason he's in there is to save a young boy, and kind of like, and and you're like, oh, okay, I guess that's noble, but really, it it kind of is. It's also about saving him and and Gyro just not giving up his moral ideals, and saying like, I'm not going to kill this kid because he's a kid, kind of deal. There's like he's an executioner, and he wants to. To back it up, the Gyro's whole backstory is that he comes from a family of doctors, but also work as executioners in secret for the king, if I'm correct, it's the royal for family. The, it's for the uh, the po- the popes. Um, what's that place the, in Italy? This uh, Vatican. The Vatican. Yeah, he works for. The Except Vatican. he's from the. Yeah, it's. No wait, he's from, he? No. Hot no, he's from, from Naples. Okay. He's from Naples. So. Pardon. The royal family there, or whatever, and he acts as executioner, and essentially. Uh, a a coup gets started, and this kid is found with in the home of one of the the coup leaders because he happened to be working as like a as a as a shoe shiner or something. And so to be safer than sorry, they're like kill the boy. The boy is like six years old. And and so a bunch of other things happen, and and basically Gyro's dad tells him it's like your first execution is going to be this kid. Because you need to learn that it doesn't matter. You just have to do your duty. And and so Gyro sets up and says, like, no, there it does matter because you're you're telling me to sacrifice a piece of my soul. And so compare that to Valentine, who is the president of the United States and his duty is to protect the United States. He's just like, Yeah, I'll just I'll become a monster to protect the United States. Mm-hmm. I'm more than willing. Like I will I will straight up murder people. I will go across time and space to collect the things that I need. I will literally kill myself over and over again to make sure I win. And, and so, so they're diametrically opposed in, in the fact of duty. That, yeah. That's, that's a good, yeah, Man, I like you that. You know what? I really like this because the whole time I had always, uh, I'd never considered Valentine as a foil for Gyro. I was always, always analyzing like, oh, how is he a foil to Johnny? But now that you mentioned it, yeah, there's a, there's a pretty, uh, there's a pretty hard contrast here. Yeah, and it's and that's another kind of like other theme, and it it touches on Sandman a bit about the difference between like duty for your people. You kind of it's funny because you have the opposite effect in Sandman in the very first chapter where you see Sandman, um, he was reading books and studying the white man language and what their words not mine. <laughs> yeah, it is what um, it is. Yeah, and 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 like you know he gets found out and his tribe the the organization he belongs to is like you are not sticking to our customs you are not one of us we're kicking you out and we're going to kill you for it kind of deal and sandman's just like i'm doing whatever i can to save our village i'm going to compete in this race i'm going to buy the land back i'm going to learn everything about the united states government so you you kind of get this glimpse of the idea of like what are you willing to sacrifice to achieve your goal even if it means you're directly oppose the people that you're saving or doing or whatever so like that, that it kind of like sneaks in there at the very beginning of like oh hey the idea of like opposing ideologies and the meanings and the ends for these goals is a kind of a key conflict throughout all of this because good. Like yeah it. it's it, yeah it's it, it was something that i realized on my like second read through of the mm-hmm the part where it's like oh this is literally what's happening with um not literally but it's, it's a close of like an opposite of kind of what is uh going on with gyro. gyro and Valentine. yeah yeah and so you you kind of get a glimpse into that on a smaller scale before it becomes like really big um so so really like the big thing is like and, and johnny says this i think at the very beginning we're like this is a story about how he like comes to terms with himself and coming back to zero but it's also like him telling the story of him and gyro 
and him like seeing Gyro's progression through his eyes. Yeah. And really, Johnny doesn't shift into that full protagonist role until the very end of the part. Yes, because and, uh, we were mentioning earlier how he sacrifices stuff for Gyro, but in his murder boner quest, it gets <laughs> even darker from that point in Bradley's favorite arc, which is Civil War. Oh my god, I love Civil War, but I don't have I'll, that's a whole episode in and of itself <laughs> let's uh let's do some quick uh just finishing thoughts uh, i guess i'll start um because we're like 35 into this 20 minute segment as we do that's not bad that's pretty good it's honestly steel ball run deserves even more than this but you know what this is a good starter maybe we'll, we'll probably bring it up again like yeah. i'll see some sort of like pamphlet it's like hey this reminds me of something from steel ball run and i want to talk about it um so Steel Ball Run, it's 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 honestly a masterpiece. You can really see what Araki can do. Araki's the writer and author of JoJo's. What he can do on a monthly schedule, uh, which Steel oh, yeah. Ball Run. We should. Yeah, we should mention <laughs> that. Yeah. Um. So like, just for backup sake. Um. So JoJo's Bizarre Adventure started in Shonen Jump. It was a weekly manga, which meant in eighty six, I believe, it started. Yeah, in ni- like nineteen eighty six, it started, and it was published every week. So Araki had to write week to week um that's really hard like it try to r- write one page of some of a narrative every week <laughs> and just do one page every week but have a full novel by the end of it but also it's, make it's, it interesting and, and, and engaging and action-packed yeah. it's a talk and, and consistent <laughs> <laughs> so he sacrificed that last one to make the other ones really pop right um, um but, like, there was always something in JoJo's where, like, oh, I see what he's doing here, especially in part four. And, like, in part one, it was there, but, like, part one's executed kind of, like, weirdly and poorly. It's part age. four, it's really, yeah, it's really aged poorly. Uh, part four really had that kind of subtle, like, tones of, like, community and, like, monsters of community and, like, interactions between people. Loneliness, solitude versus community is a big Yeah. Part, part four is one we'll get to in the future. It's, it's my favorite part. It's one of my favorite yeah. things ever. Um, these guys have heard me talk about it enough, but now you're gonna hear me talk about it uh, later. Later. But, but, the, but the part we're getting to is that there was always this hint of Iraqi like wanting to tell a more fleshed out story and more Something fleshed more out mature, characters too. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I want to say a quarter through, not a quarter, but like a, a I want to say two or three volumes into Steel Ball Run, he switches to Ultra Jump, which is the monthly version of Shonen Jump. Yes. Um, so it doubles the length of each chapters, but it also doubles his time to make these chapters. Quadruples his time to make these chapters. Well, yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah, and so he he really each chapter doesn't like drag, except for one, which is a real kind of weird out of nowhere <laughs> chapter. But each one has its purpose. You mean the best We're chapter. Reading... <laughs> yeah, like Willer and I are reading Jojolian like right now, Ooh. and I don't know Willer's thoughts. But to me, Dojolian's so tightly written, and it comes back, and everything that's like offered up there comes back with some sort of meaning. Where Except in like for other like part... one thing, and like me and Joe have both like moved past it. Yeah, and that's Araki being Araki. But like, it, but everything is so tightly together that you can really tell. Like Araki knows like what it takes to make a good story. It's just the time crunch was not beneficial to him at all compared to oda who can who has the story like Oda's mapped down in his head and um so but but on to f- final points here um yeah we we have to set that groundwork also me and joe will be talking about joe jolion periodically because i'm fucking having a great if you're not liking joe jolion either don't read monthly or like read it in binges because it was really fun catching up and now me and joe are both so invested that every chapter is just great um, yeah, we'll probably bring it up in like whatever, it whatever, comes whenever. Out. Yeah. Um, Bradley should. We'll start it one day, and then we'll talk about that then. Uh, so my final <laughs> thoughts <laughs> on Steel Ball Run. Um, amazing trio of characters between Johnny Gyro and Valentine. In hot such pants. A, <laughs> such a strong trio. All right, we'll, we'll get there now. I fucking hate hot pants. Uh, oh god. I am a notorious hot pants hater because her stand is so convenient all the fucking time and that's um, all we're going to talk about hot pants because that's, that's a whole other segment you know what let's not get yeah let's not get into it i know iraqi's done it before but this one's annoyed me the most um she's all right as a person uh, uh i like all the all the minor villains man ringo wrote again fucking uh mike O. 
Diego. They're all good. So, such good minor villains. Um, even Pork Pie Hat Kid, he's cool. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, really good finale. I'll bring this up. Um, really fantastic finale. Finale. The standoff between Johnny and Valentine at the end with the "I want to trust you" a hundred and one percent line. Fucking. Oh man, masterclass. But then Iraqi adds the DLC chapter. Yeah, and I. Uh... I think I'm the most sour on this chapter out of everyone here. If you've read Steel Ball Run, you know exactly what the DLC chapter is and the high voltage, high voltage arc. Like I liked it, but just <sighs> did, did we need it? When when someone brought up that the horses were moving and and you know the the shenanigans that were going on, I was like, oh fuck, it's even worse than I thought. <laughs> Anyways, all right, that that's it for me. Let's uh, uh, go. For, when I when I read Steel Ball Run, I kind of like was at a lower point of like my life. Joe was, was at negative, and it got him to plus ten. Yeah, and plus ultra, plus ultra. ultra. Um, but to me, the, the biggest thing about the the story that I really enjoyed and thought was is the the idea of standing back up and getting over like the failures in your life and where it's come and just kind of like learning to to keep like getting back getting yourself back up to zero and that it's not always about being the best because the, the one of the first things that like you immediately notice right off the bat is johnny does not want to win the race that's his lowest priority that the entirety of the part the only thing that matters is he figures out how to get back to zero and he thinks by riding with gyro he's going to learn that and so just the idea that like sometimes like your life isn't about being the best it's just making sure you can stand up for yourself and it was it was great it was wonderful i read break my heart and it nearly broke my heart Aww. um so it's great town time it's probably the best manga i've read uh of everything so far in my life one piece is getting real up there it's probably one piece is probably at number two now because one piece is real good I'll, um, I'll take that because I got all of these guys into One Piece and JoJo's. I did the, I did all of this. This podcast happened because of me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. um, but, yeah, I, I think of any of the parts that I would want to see animated or adapted, it's part seven just because, A, I think it tells a really great story, and B, there is so much shit that I really just want to see move and be animated and Black just have – yeah. Yeah. Blackmore. A better clarification on how some things interact, like with the fucking cups. Jesus. Um. But yeah, it's just it's one of those things that I just hold dear to my heart and just I really love. CGI horses, yeah. Joe. CGI uh, horses. CGI we don't talk horses. about those. It's okay. It'll be fine. All right, it's not the CGI baseball players. <laughs> yeah. Sing us off. Uh, sing us off. That's not a term. Whatever. Um, to, uh, I don't know, Steel Ball Run. I was really happy because, uh, it was very hyped up for me. And with a lot of hype comes the fear that something won't live up, but it far surpassed the hype that I had received for it. Um, and to make me doubly pleased, uh, when I had previously read Stone Ocean, uh, unpopular opinion, it at the time was my favorite part of JoJo's oh, by we'll a huge talk margin. About that. Yeah. And uh, I was really upset because I was like, I, as much as I loved it, I was like, oh, I don't, I don't think JoJo's can get better than this. There's no way Steel Bar runs that good, and uh, it was that good. And I, I want to add to that that Bradley is the harshest among us. Bradley's fucking harsh about shit. All right, there's this arc in Stone Ocean that he hated. And me and Joe can't remember which one, but we were like, we were like, Bradley's done. He's not gonna read anything anymore. Like. Like he's not gonna make it the still all run. Like literally, we just he was, like, he was done. Because Bradley's but then by the time really, I finished it, it was my favorite. You see, yeah. so he can turn around. He's really into consistency and like consistent power sets. He's really into that. Um, yeah, like like when Willer was talking about uh, hot pants, I I usually tremendously dislike something done for convenience sake, and that's very much what uh, Gold Experience and Cream Starter are. Yeah, a little bit of White Snake, a little bit too. Yeah. Um. Well, now Bradley can one day start the actual best part. 
<laughs> for ball run. Uh, yeah, uh, I can reread Steel Ball One. A okay, so yeah, let, that that's it for our criminally short Steel Ball Run segment at forty four minutes. But all right, maybe we can let Tyler speak again. I'm gonna I'm gonna before we head out for the day. I have a question I want what? everybody to think about and reflect on. There's, at there's, home. there's two quick segments left. Let's just fucking roll into them. Oh, shit. We have two more segments? There... <laughs> <laughs> this is our first time. I'm just going to talk about some movies I watched recently, and then Bradley's going to hit us with you... an outro segment. I'm going to put a timer on. You have five <laughs> minutes. All right. Are you ready? Three, for... three Identical Strangers is a story. Uh, this, five is too short. We'll go however. Three, oh, identical sh- three Identical Strangers is a documentary about three people that were identical twins, and they were separated at birth um, from, like, a plot-twisty event. It's it, This is a real story, by the way. And it follows how much it fucks you up to meet someone who is you uh, when you're 19 years old, and how it affects the people around you, and how you compare yourself to each other, and how the world views you. They, they became, like, superstars for a while. So it's pretty pretty bad. Um, that's like a solid 3.5 out of 5. Uh, uh, the Martian. I just watched The Martian. That's a really good fucking movie. It's a feel good. It is a really good fucking movie. Yeah, Bradley, talk a little bit. Uh, it's a really good fucking movie. I mean, that you, you already gave the full, uh, There summary. you have it, folks. It's a real good fucking movie. Uh, <laughs> Matt Damon was great. It's good, too. Uh, I, I give it like a solid 4, maybe 4.5. It's, it reminds me of Dr. Stone, where it's like, yeah, fuck yeah, science, but, but like, it really darker. Is. Um, sorry to bother you. I know Tyler also watched this one, so maybe he can jump in. It's this, I thought, like, it started off incredibly, where, um, it's this movie about a guy who's a telemarketer, and then he starts putting on, like, a white voice. He's black. Um, he's, like, at a low point of his life. He's trying to climb up. Um, uh, but he's also kind of greedy about it, so he starts putting on a white voice, and he's just killing it at his telemarketing job, and he rises up to this, like, really high tier... And it's got a really good amount of commentary on like socialism and racial divides and capital and like all that shit. And it, it's it's not ham fisted about it. It comes at it from a lot of different angles, uh, which I appreciate. But then the end, I appreciate what they were going for at the end, but it just became way less interesting. It's a really cool premise. Uh, I'm interested. It's it, I, it, I recommend it. it. I, I agree with uh, Willer. It, it started off real strong. It like tried to do some weird symbolism stuff that, like, I felt like it didn't really hit. Like mm-hmm. at certain points, it was like, oh yeah, like uh, you know, like the earrings. You know, like it, it, like at yeah. one point it was yeah, like, they were a little extra. Um. Also, I would like to point out that uh, the main character's white voice is done by David Cross. Oh, I knew well it sounded familiar. Yeah, whenever most well known for his comedy, uh, comedy and being the main antagonist in Alvin and the Chipmunks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his crowning role. Uh, yeah, whenever the the black main character speaks in his white voice, there's a very bad dub over it. It's really funny. Um, yeah, like it symbolically. It's not even that I don't understand the symbolism they were going for at the end. It, the movie just gets less interesting at that point. Like the climax mm-hmm. is really boring. Um, but the beginning, warning. beginning so strong for me. Uh, t- minutes. Anything else, Tyler? You want to say about that one? I, I gave it like a two and a half. Jo- yeah, I'll give it like a, a three point five, maybe a three. Um, three and a half sounds fair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joe, did you say two minutes? Relax, bro. I'm you gonna, got one forty there, now. There's two left. Fuck off. Okay, I watched Akira for the first time. Uh, that's a really good animated movie. They do re- cool things with lighting, and thematically, there's this really good theme about forcing growth and forcing maturity um, that I picked up on. It, at least that's I really enjoy that about the movie. It's so well animated. It shouldn't be remade because it can't live up to the animated version. Uh, I know Bradley watched this. You didn't like it very much in the past, did you? The movie gets a four head out of five. Hey. <laughs> we take the like, got a big ass <laughs> He's not wrong. Uh, I think Bradley would like this movie. Um, yeah, I haven't watched it in like maybe seven years. So it, I feel now like that a, I'm a, a mature Bradley would enjoy. A mature it. Bradley would probably appreciate it more. Bradley used to watch Lucky Star every day, so you know. <laughs> Fifty seconds <laughs> implying it's All right, not the best. Revenge show. is a revenge movie about this woman who she's kind of like a trashy, not very 
classy woman in the start. Um, some guys, she gets terrible things happen to her, and then she almost dies in an accident that's gonna throw a lot of people off the movie because it's so severe. Um, she gets up from that accident, and then the movie's just this amazing revenge flick with like really good, see- like this final scene of like her chasing down the last guy is so well shot. And that's like a solid four out of five. And that's all my movies, Joe. Fucking relax, okay? You did it. You have thirteen seconds left. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna. gonna I'm gonna ask. Shut, shut, shut the, the fuck up. The, I'm gonna ask. Actually, it was fun. It's the best DC movie out there. Go see it. It's kind of neat. All right, that's it. Shazam, We're out of time. That, that was Shazam. Okay, hold on. I want to do a quick worm talk. Uh, I've been reading a a web series called Worm, which is Bradley's favorite thing. Um, it is very good, if you ask me. Bradley and no fucking one else. loves it, and I'm in the middle so far. I do like it, but it's like it's averaging at like a. I'd say it's averaging like a 3.5 now, Bradley, which is a little. Which high. is a it, it, that's a good score. Um, my problems with Worm is that I don't think the action's particularly good. I don't like the characters and the dialogue. Uh, you know how a lot of people handle like serious moments differently. Like, say we're all drunk. And we're like, we're venting to each other. We're all going to vent in different ways. And we're all going to address our insecurities in different ways. In Worm, half to 75% of the characters, they're really mature. And they're like, hey man, I was being really shitty about it. And it was because I was feeling like this. But really, I think it was because I I really had this deep down inside. They're all really well adjusted and mature. And that applies to almost every character in it. Yeah, it's a very, uh, it's a very... It's a very serious story, yes. And uh, on some level, it can be attributed to the fact that uh, in this universe, only particular types of people or personalities are going to uh, get powers or be involved in the story. It, it's a really but realistic other... uh, hero story, just yeah. the purpose. But on the that... other hand, Willer is correct. It, it's a uh... I think I think that's a big consequence of the tone. It's an extremely serious story. It's some character. A lot of characters lose individuality. Um, I am. I just finished Arc Nine, and I will be slowly going through that. And that that's all I got. So very cool. We can move on to the outro portion. Uh, you had something for us. That's all, folks. Oh, oh yeah. Um, I I brought a big question to the table, uh, guys, and uh, I'm afraid it might tear us all apart. Um, what I've what I've really been wondering is um, if someone offered you three million dollars, but if you take the three million dollars, you gain a split personality disorder, <laughs> and you can't choose when your your personality swaps over, and the other personality is SpongeBob. Oh Jesus! <laughs> and this will last the rest of your life. Well, Would it's, you be- take it's better than dollars? Diavolo, so... I'm taking the three million, because I'm basically this one's already. Yeah. Something yeah. to think about. Pass. I'll have to pass. Tyler, you gotta answer. Oh, dude, definitely. Yeah? Uh-oh. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Imagine how great you'd be around kids. <laughs>